Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. Gallopoff, The Talking Pony by Tudor Jinx Chapter 1, An Adventure in Russia Yes, said Lola, as she and her cousin Pauline were visiting her pony one afternoon. He's a Russian pony, and when first seen by my father, he was owned by a nobleman while we were living in St. Petersburg. How old is he? asked Pauline. I don't know, or rather, I forget. But you can see that he must be beyond his youth, for his mane and his tail are white, answered Lola. That isn't from age, said the pony. The girls started back. They had never heard an animal talk, and naturally they were surprised. I didn't know you could talk, exclaimed Lola. You never said a word to me in all the years I've owned you. Maybe not, said the pony coolly, but this is the first time I have had a chance. You see, every animal has one day in the year when it can talk until sunset, and this is my day. It is my birthday, you know. And how old are you? asked Pauline, beginning to recover from her surprise. Only eight, replied the pony. It isn't age that made my mane and tail white. It is the result of one night's experience in Russia. You've heard that people's hair turns white sometimes in a single night? Yes, answered both girls. Well, the pony went on, that is the way it was with me. I had a very trying experience during my youth in Russia. And since I seldom have an audience on the days that I can talk, I shall be glad to tell you the story, if you care to listen. The girls said they would be delighted, and finding a flat stone, sat down upon it ready to listen. They soon made room for the pony beside them, but he smiled and shook his head, saying, We horses always rest standing. Make yourselves comfortable, and you shall learn my story. Then he began thus. I was foaled just eight years ago, today, on a large estate not far from Charkov, in Little Russia, and grew up the pet of the children of my master, who was a Russian nobleman. I don't know just what his rank was, but the children, there were two, were known as the prince and princess. When I was old enough, I became the little prince's saddle horse, and many a delightful gallop we had over the fields. The little princess rode another pony, a little older and bigger than I, in fact, my own elder brother. As the country about the estate was not thickly settled and was heavily wooded, the children could not go far from home except on horseback, and we were out with them nearly every day. We seldom ventured out at night except in summer, for there were wolves in the woods, and when these were hungry they did not hesitate to attack any one and they were big gray fellows not to be despised i can tell you my adventure was with these wolves as i have already said the children did not ride out at night alone and they would not have been allowed to do so except for an accident it was in this way the prince and princess went one day to visit the children of a neighbor to celebrate a birthday or rather, a name-day fate. We set out about midday all alone, for we expected to return the next day, spending the night at our friend's house. The fate was delightful. Even we horses enjoyed it, for we all had been bedecked with ribbons and rosettes, and were served with extra rations of the most delicious oats, with lumps of sugar and other dainties. Late at night, after the festivities were over, 
a careless servant set fire to some of the hangings, and soon the house was in serious danger. By the most vigorous exertions, the main part of the house was saved, but one of the wings was so badly injured by fire and water that the guests at the house were crowded out, and those who lived nearest decided to go home. Among these were my little prince and princess. It was early twilight when we started, and there would have been time to reach home before dark, except that the prince insisted upon taking a wrong turning in a wood. My brother and I tried hard to take the right road, but the prince would insist on going astray, and we had to submit. Besides, we were not entirely certain they were going home and we yielded when he would not be guided by us. So we got deeper and deeper into the dark woods, and further and further from home. The prince still was headstrong, until suddenly we heard the howling of the wolves. That brought him to his senses at once. Knowing he was lost, he threw the reins upon my neck, telling his sister to do the same with her pony. My brother and I, too, had heard the wolves, and we were just about to take the bits between our teeth and start for home when we found ourselves free to choose the road. We wheeled about and made for home as fast as we could put our hoofs to the ground. But fast as we went, the howling came louder and louder to our ears, and we knew the wolves were gaining. Luckily, the snow was light and powdery, and we did not slip or flounder about. On and on we went, hoping to get out of the woods where our footing was less secure than in the open fields. We could run splendidly, if I do say it and we reached the open before the wolves came nearer than within half a mile, and then it seemed to me we had never gone so like the wind. But fast as we were, those great sinewy wolves were swifter, and slowly they drew nearer and nearer until we could see that there was a pack of seven. We knew, of course, just how far we were from home, and I felt my heart sink within me, when I suddenly realized that the wolves would reach us before we came to the village where we might expect help from the peasants. My brother must have come to the same conclusion about the time I did, for I heard his breath come with a great gasp, though I knew he could not be exhausted. Then, my dear children, I had the brightest idea of my life. I suddenly slackened my pace and when I was near a bank of soft snow, I deliberately shook my master off. At the same moment, I gave a whinny, which my brother understood, and he stopped. I rubbed noses with him, making him understand what I had in mind, and then charged back toward the wolves. That was brave, said Lola. Not at all, replied the pony frankly. It was clever, if you like, but not brave. I knew that it was my only chance. Scared? I was scared out of my senses, but I kept my wits. Seeing that I was gone, my master mounted behind his sister, and away they went, going somewhat slower, it is true, but still at a fine pace. Meanwhile, I took my stand in the open plain, meaning to sell my life as dearly as possible. Do you know how horses fight wolves? No, said Pauline. With their heels, said the pony. I was lithe and active then, and I was so excited that I felt like a bundle of steel springs. The wolves surrounded me, but kept out of reach for a little time. Whenever one would make a leap, I would kick out, sometimes with one hoof, sometimes with both. And out of those seven wolves, I killed two and disabled two more. Splendid, exclaimed the girls, clapping their hands. It was good, said the pony. 
but all the time I kept longing for the sound of another horse's hoofs. I knew my master would try to rescue me, and that I was safe if I could only hold out. I leaped, I shied, I reared, I bounded. The wolves were more cautious now, for they are cowardly brutes, but every instant I had to keep in motion, and again and again one would attack. I do not know how long I kept them at bay, but finally I heard a rifle shot in the distance. Then came another and another, nearer and nearer. The fourth shot knocked over one of the wolves. The others took flight, yelping, and I was safe. The people from the village had come at full speed and just in time. I was taken home in triumph and tenderly cared for. But as soon as it was light next morning, I found that my mane, my beautiful black mane and tail, were white as snow. How did it happen that your master ever parted with you? asked Lola, after she had thanked the pony for his story. That is an interesting thing, too, said the pony. I... But just then, the sun set, and the poor pony wouldn't say another word. He shook his head sadly, and pointed with his nose at the setting sun. Lola and Pauline, luckily, had several lumps of sugar with them, and these seemed to console the pony wonderfully, but he wouldn't do more than Winnie his thanks. End of chapter 1 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 2 of Gallop Off, The Talking Pony This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Gallop Off, The Talking Pony by Tudor Jinx Chapter 2 Gallop off is sold. The little girls were delighted to find that their pony could talk, and made many plans to make sure that they should be on hand the next birthday of the pony, so that they might hear how he came to leave his young master, the Russian prince. They used to go often to the little fellow's stable, and there talked about his escape from the wolves. There was a calendar hanging near his stall, and on this they carefully marked Galopoff's birthday. Though it was nearly a full year ahead of time, as they reckoned it, for only a month had passed since Galopoff's first story. While the little girls were making a broad black pencil mark around the supposed date, they were startled to hear the pony's gentle voice behind them. "'What are you doing?' asked Galopoff, coming close up, for he was so gentle that he was never fastened in the stall. "'Goodness, how you startled me!' exclaimed Lola. And then she added, flushing rosy red, "'Oh, Galopoff, what a story you told!' "'Yes,' the pony replied, tossing his mane with a little conceit. "'It was a pretty good story.' "'Ah, but she doesn't mean that,' Pauline explained. "'She means that you ought to be ashamed of yourself because you told a lie.' "'What do you mean?' said the pony very sharply. "'Why, you said,' Lola went on, "'that you could talk only on your birthdays till sunset, "'and here you are talking again only a month later. "'You little storyteller!' "'Oh, then the pony whinnied heartily. "'It was his way of laughing. "'When he could catch his breath, he said, "'My dear children, your mistake was very natural.' You thought I had a birthday only once a year. But you said so, I think, Pauline insisted. I didn't mean to, the pony replied. The trouble is, I have been so much with people that I talk as they do. Now, my dears, horses have birthdays once a month. You see, we live only about a dozen years, and it is fair that our birthdays should come oftener than yours, or else we shouldn't have so many. Isn't that reasonable? It seems so, Lola answered thoughtfully. And then I suppose those little mayflies that live only a day have a birthday every hour? No doubt, said Galopoff impatiently, but I don't care to talk of flies. I hate all the pesky little things. Ugh! 
and Galopoff made a wild snort, so both little girls jumped. We won't talk about flies then, Lola agreed, but we want to know how you came to leave the little Russian prince after you had saved his life from the wolves. But the sun is getting low now, objected the pony, glancing through the open stable door toward the western hills. Maybe I shan't be able to finish. Oh, then do hurry, said Pauline, sitting down upon a truss of hay and drawing Lola to her side. Wait till I get a few oats, so that my mouth will not be dry, said the pony, and he seized a few from his manger, chewed them thoughtfully a moment or two, and then began his story. Let me see, he said, turning his head on one side. I told you about our return after I had been rescued from the wolves, though I do think, he added in a low tone, that I might have beaten them all alone, and said that my little master was very grateful. No doubt he would have liked to keep me all my life in comfort, but, unfortunately, his father, though a rich Russian nobleman, had been very extravagant and had lost much of his money in foolish schemes. He tried to do a great deal for the poor people on his estates, and there were so many of them. Before he knew it, he became deeply in debt to moneylenders, and after a year or two, the end of his resources was reached. He was compelled to sell his property, everything he had in the world. I can't tell you how it came about, for I am only a talking pony, not a lawyer, you know. I saw only what I saw. One unhappy day, there was a grand sale of all the livestock of the estate. Horses, cattle, sheep, fowls, all had to go. Great crowds of men in long woolen coats and cloth hats thronged about examining us and talking us over all the morning, and at last the auctioneer began the sale. I don't like to recall that unhappy time, so I will tell only what concerns me. I was led into the ring of buyers, and the bidding began. Though some of the men tried to cheapen me because my mane and tail were white, the auctioneer proved by my teeth that I was still a young, strong horse, and the bids were rather quick and high. Pretty soon, I saw that my little master was trying to buy me for himself. Poor little chap! He hadn't much, but all he had, he had put into his purse, and there he stood, bidding bravely for his dear little pony. I tell you, children, it made me husky. Some of the dealers were good-hearted fellows, with children of their own at home, and they stopped trying to buy me. They saw that it was a boy trying to buy his own pet, and they said to one another, Let the boy have his pony. But there's always a mean scamp or two in every crowd, and one of them had made up his mind that he would buy me at any price. So he and my little master were soon left alone in the bidding. One hundred roubles, said the dealer. One hundred and ten, said the boy. And twenty, said the dealer. Twenty-five, said the master. But his face turned pale, and I could see that he had not a single kopeck more. The dealer saw it too. One hundred and twenty-six, he said, and turning with a taunting grin at the boy. The little fellow said nothing. He had no more money, and I saw him choke down a sob as he looked at me with tears in his eyes. I felt choky myself, I confess. Then suddenly, just as the auctioneer was about to bring down his hammer for the last time, a new voice was heard. One hundred and fifty, it cried, with a queer foreign accent. Fifty-five, said the dealer doggedly, but he no longer smiled. He saw that the new bidder was an American gentleman, and Russians of that class believe all Americans are millionaires, so he was scared. One hundred and sixty, said the American. It was your father, Lola, as you no doubt have guessed. Well, you know the rest. Your father was resolved that so mean a man should not own the pony, and he soon outbid the dealer. When the pony was knocked down, your father turned and said with a smile, Take your pony, my boy. I'm glad to see you love him enough to give all you have to keep him, and keep him you shall. Then how everybody cheered as the mean dealer sneaked away, and how they laughed 
when I curvetted and jumped about with joy. And how happy we were, my little master and I. But how did you come to America, asked Pauline, if you were given back to your master? Oh, that came about very naturally, answered Gallop off the Pony. You see, my little master was then... And then, strange to say, the pony began to neigh and whinny and make very queer noises. The little girls were frightened for a moment, and then they suddenly remembered that the pony lost the power of speech at sunset, and they looked out of the stable door and saw that the sun had hidden behind the hills. Never mind, said Lola, it is only waiting a month, just as we should have to wait for a serial story in the magazine. End of chapter 2, recording by Scarlett, Louisiana. Chapter 3 of Gallop Off the Talking Pony. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gallop Off the Talking Pony by Tudor Jinx. Chapter 3, The Motto for Gallop Off. Pauline, said Lola to her little friend, one afternoon a week or two, after the pony Galopoff had told his second story, which, by the way, did not altogether agree with the first account of his adventures. Do you know, I sometimes wonder whether Galopoff always tells the truth? So do I, answered Pauline, for I noticed how he said the first day he talked to us that he could speak only one day in the year while the second time he said that he could talk once a month. I noticed that too, Lola replied, and there were some other queer things about his stories. But after all, what does it matter? Ponies don't have to obey the same rules that we do. I am sure he's not naughty, for he hasn't a single trick. He never kicks, nor bites, nor balks, nor does any of the things that are wrong for a horse. He's a good pony, whether he tells the truth or not. Perhaps he forgets or is mistaken. He ought to be talked to and made to tell the truth, Pauline insisted. I know what we can do. What? Lola asked. Why, let us make one of those mottoes about always speaking the truth and hang it up in his stall, Pauline answered, just as they do in school. Come, we can paint it and tie it with ribbons. It will be great fun, will you? Do you think he'll like it? asked Lola doubtfully. I shouldn't like to hurt his feelings. Oh, let's try it anyway, said Pauline eagerly. I just love to paint things, and I know where there is a splendid piece of white cardboard. The idea of the white cardboard was too great a temptation to Lola, and she agreed. So both of the girls went up to Lola's room, and after about an hour's work, appeared going toward the stable bearing a motto painted on the cardboard in fancy letters of scarlet and green, and decorated with a brilliant satin ribbon by which to hang it up in Galopoff's stall. The pony was at the blacksmith's being fitted with a new pair of shoes, and so the little girls entered his neat stall and hung up the motto where he would see it. It read as follows, Better that the feet slip than the tongue. There, exclaimed Pauline, doesn't it look perfectly lovely? And it is such a good lesson, too. Yes, said Lola slowly, but I'm afraid that the pony won't like it very well. It seems as if we were rather young to be giving him lessons. Still, we'll let it stay there and see what he says about it when he can talk again. So the two little girls went back to the house and began to play backgammon, and in the interest of the game soon forgot all about the pony and the motto. Galopoff returned from the blacksmith's with two new pairs of shoes, and as soon as he entered his stall he caught sight of the motto. He looked at it carefully with his head turned toward the right, then he took a view of it with his head tilted over to the left, then he smelled of it very cautiously and knew at once, as animals do, that Lola and Pauline had brought it there. Then he showed his teeth, either in a smile or in anger. But at last he picked it up in his lips, raised it until he could lift it down from the nail, and after a few trials, 
by tossing his head, succeeded in throwing the loop of ribbon around his neck, so that the motto hung down upon his chest. Having arranged this little matter to his satisfaction, he helped himself to a good mouthful of oats, and munched, and munched, and munched. He seemed to be thinking very hard. When Pat, the stableman, came in to prepare the stable for the night, he noticed the motto hanging on Gallopoff's neck. "'Sure, it's a queer contraption ye do have there, Gallopoff," said he. "'Is it a signpost ye think ye are?' And so, saying, he raised his hand to take it off. But the pony at once turned away from Pat. And as the stableman again went toward the pony's head, the pony once more turned, so as to keep the motto out of the man's reach. "'So that's it, is it?' exclaimed Pat. "'Well, ye may cape your bib on for all me.' and he went out, locking the stable door behind him. The next morning, Pat came early to harness Gallopoff to take the little girls to school in the pony cart. But again, though Gallopoff let Pat harness him, the pony would not permit the man to take the motto from his neck. Consequently, when the pony cart was drawn up before the front door, the motto still hung on Gallopoff's chest. "'Oh, Lola, look!' exclaimed Pauline as the girls came down the steps. "'Gallopoff is wearing our motto around his neck. "'Did you put it on him, Pat?' "'Twas himself, if it wasn't you,' said Pat. "'I did me best to take the chistprichter off him, "'but never a hand would he lave me put on it.' "'Let me try,' said Lola, going to the pony's head. "'But Gallopoff, very quietly, but quite decidedly, "'backed away from her.' And so, after a few attempts, Lola had to give up. Come, said she to Pauline at last, we shall be late to school unless we hurry. Jump in, never mind the motto. But we can't go through the town with Gallopoff wearing that thing around his neck, Pauline objected. There's nothing else to do, said Lola, jumping into the pony cart and gathering up the reins. So Pauline climbed in and they started Gallopoff being perfectly gentle and obedient so long as no one attempted to remove the motto. People laughed to see the pony trotting along wearing the fancy motto around his neck, and long before the school was reached both girls were heartily ashamed of their work. Day after day passed on, and still Gallopoff, while perfectly gentle and docile in every other respect, insisted upon wearing the motto around his neck. The girls could hardly wait for sunrise of the day of the month upon which Gallopoff had said he could speak. And when the morning came at last, they hurried through their breakfast and ran to the stable as quickly as they could. Now, Gallopoff, you can speak today, can't you? asked Lola, as soon as she opened the stable door. But the pony only whinnied as he looked meaningly at Pat, who was mending a strap at the other end of the stable. "'He won't speak if there's anybody here but ourselves,' said Pauline softly. "'Let's take him out into the pasture.' They unfastened the bar before the stall, and Gallopoff trotted after them out of the stable door, with the motto dangling from his neck, and followed them into the fields. "'Now,' said Lola, taking a seat upon the flat stone again, "'please, Gallopoff, tell us why you are wearing that thing around your neck.' "'I am sure I don't know.' Gallopoff replied, looking almost cross-eyed in trying to gaze at it with both eyes at once. Didn't you girls mean it for me? Yes, but not to wear round your neck, answered Pauline. Well, I know that it has reading on it, said Gallopoff, and I never learned to read English, though I read Russian easily enough. But I made up my mind that it was either something nice or something mean. If it was something nice, I wanted to wear it for my own sake. If it was something mean, why, I thought you'd get tired of it before I did. What do you think of my plan? Both girls were silent and looked uncomfortable. Ah, said Gallopoff, with much meaning. Then, after a moment, he said a little huskily, So you meant to be mean to me? Now, girls, that doesn't seem very nice of you, does it? No, and I'm sorry, said Lola. So am I, said Pauline, almost at the same moment. "'Well, I won't ask what's written on the cardboard,' said Gallopoff. "'But, in order to punish you a little, "'I'll put off telling you how I came to America until next month.' "'Oh, don't do that,' said the girls. "'We'll be good.' 
but I have to think up the story, said Galopoff. Think it up, repeated Pauline. Why, I thought it was true. So it is, mostly true, said Galopoff. But horses are not so particular as men about telling things just as they happen. We think that makes things too dull. We are driven so much that we prefer to be free in our minds when the bridle is out of our mouths. No, no story today. Next month, or next week, I'll tell you how I came to America. Next week, Pauline exclaimed in spite of herself. Why, first you could speak only once a year, then once a month, and now it's once a week? I can speak every day I like, said Galopoff a little stiffly. And if I don't like, I needn't speak at all. What difference does it make to you? No difference at all, Galopoff dear, said Lola. And we will come next week to hear your story. But Galopoff was already nipping the grass, having dropped the motto when he put his head down, and not another syllable would he say. Isn't it queer, whispered Pauline, as they went back to the house. I don't know, Lola answered. We hear men speak of horse sense. Maybe what Galopoff talks is horse truth. No matter, said Pauline. We can make believe that it is make believe. And so they left. End of chapter 3 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 4 of Galopoff the Talking Pony This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Galopoff the Talking Pony by Tudor Jinks Chapter 4 Galopoff's Life in a Circus One morning, while Lola and her cousin Pauline were sitting at the breakfast table and trying to eat all the cream and sugar in their saucers without getting any more of the new cereal food than they could help, they were suddenly surprised to see Pat, the stableman, appear at the doorway. They saw at once by his face that he was worried and anxious. "'What is it, Pat?' Lola asked. "'Galopoff has run away,' said Pat, in a voice that showed his amazement. "'Run away?' said Lola. "'Why, it isn't possible.' "'Well, then,' Pat answered, "'if he's not run away, he's walked away, or took the trolley.' "'Sure, I think the little beggar is capable of it.' "'But, Pat,' Pauline broke in, "'you must be mistaken. He can't have run away.' "'Maybe not.' Maybe he's hid behind the broom or in the keyhole. I don't know where he is, but he's gone entirely and left no address. Both of the little girls followed Pat to the stable, and when they came to Galopoff's stall, it was empty. They looked around everywhere, but could find nothing to show where the pony had gone. The little girls stood in the stable yard, not knowing which way to turn. I think it's very ungrateful of him, said Pauline, and I shall tell him so. Perhaps he had some good reason for going, Lola replied. He's so good and well behaved that I don't think we ought to believe he's done wrong until we know it. Let's go down to his meadow and wait there a while. Perhaps he will come back. Pauline thought this foolish, but as there was a flat rock to sit on, down in the meadow under a shady tree, the girls decided to spend the forenoon there, playing Bazique in the hope that the pony might return. They were very fond of Bazique and were soon absorbed in their game. Pauline had all of the sequence except the queen, and Lola had the double Bazique excepting the same queen of spades, and both had forgotten all about Galopoff when suddenly they were interrupted by a loud whinny. Both jumped up, and there stood Galopoff. He had come so quietly that neither had heard him. Ouch! How you scared me! exclaimed Pauline. Galopoff, where have you been? I've been to the circus, said the pony, with a twinkle in his eye. To the circus? Lola exclaimed. I didn't know there was one in town. There wasn't, Galopoff said, until last night. The posters have been up for several days. Haven't you seen the pictures? Yes, said Pauline. I saw them yesterday. 
they have a trick pony too i see so they have gallopoff replied but he doesn't amount to much he's hard working but not very bright still cantero does very well considering oh gallopoff do you know him asked lola know him said gallopoff yawning slightly i ought to know him he's a cousin of mine i got him the place when i left how do you mean pauline asked were you acquainted with the circus people certainly gallopoff answered as he snapped at a fly and missed it i used to be in that circus myself i was their trick pony that is the way i came to america you promised to tell us about it pauline reminded him can't you tell us now do you happen to have a lump of sugar about you gallopoff inquired no answered lola after looking in her pocket but i'll run to the house and get one no need of that said gallopoff jump on my back and i'll take you there in two shakes and if you'll make it two lumps i'll tell you about my coming to america lola was on his back in a moment and away they pelted and were back before you could say jack robinson robinson crusoe and swiss family robinson three times then while all three crunched sugar comfortably gallopoff told his story between bites after i was sold said he and your father nodding to lola bought me for my little master i thought my troubles were over for a while but unhappily there were some political difficulties in russia what are political difficulties asked pauline i haven't the cult of an idea said gallopoff and i don't want to know horses have flies and mosquitoes to trouble them and that's enough without politics anyway these troubles sent my big master to siberia where's that asked pauline oh way up at the top of the map said lola impatiently don't make school out of it pauline go on gallopoff well my big master had to go to siberia and my little master went with him the russian police tried to take me from my little master but i kicked up my heels and away i went as i ran off i called back to my little master that i'd meet him in america did he know you could speak no said gallopoff i never talked before that while i was in russia i don't like russian and i like english only so-so horse is the best language what's it like asked pauline like this said gallopoff and then he snorted and whinnied and coughed and neighed for quite a long time don't you think that's sweet he asked the little girls now they didn't like it at all but they were too polite to say so so they said only what does it mean it means answered gallopoff do not give me so much hay i like oats better hay is not good for the voice oats are not so bad but sugar is the best of all thank you said lola i'll teach you to neigh some time if you like said gallopoff but to go on with my story after i ran away from the russians i kept on going till it was dark and then i came to quite a large city i was not troubled by anybody because i walked so quietly along that no one suspected that i had run away they probably thought i was on my way to a stable but soon i began to be hungry and being in the city there was no grass to eat i did not know what to do luckily i saw a great circus poster and at once i had a bright idea i would become a trick pony i waited patiently about in the shadows like mary's lamb oh do you know about her asked lola i knew the lamb very well said gallopoff he wasn't much though his wool was white i must confess but no matter i waited about until the circus began and then i trotted into the ring with the whole company right at the end of the procession nobody knew where i came from but after i had walked around the ring on my hind legs and had bowed to the czar's box and had picked up with my teeth a bouquet thrown to me i was the star of the occasion weren't the circus people surprised asked pauline surprised is no word for it they couldn't do enough for me why after the performance the manager came and patted me and said he believed i could do anything but talk 
oh why didn't you say something to him asked pauline i talk only to children as a rule said galopoff ponies and children go together you know well they gave me a gold and scarlet bridle five lumps of sugar after every performance and letters on the circus posters as long as my foreleg it was glorious i stayed with the circus until they went to america how did you know they'd go asked pauline all shows come to america said galopoff besides if ours didn't i knew that some trick showman in america would buy me for of course i was the greatest trick pony that ever was since i understood whatever they said to me and i worked willingly when we came to america i kept a sharp lookout to find your father lola i knew that if i could find him he would buy me and keep me for my little master and how did you find him galopoff was about to reply when suddenly patrick appeared coming from the stable here comes that tiresome irish servant of mine said galopoff i shall have to stop now but maybe another time i'll tell you more good-bye so saying galopoff cantered away to meet patrick and his hearers went to lunch. End of chapter 4 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 5 of Galopoff the Talking Pony This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Galopoff the Talking Pony by Tudor Jinks Chapter 5 The Picnic by the River The little girls, Lola and Pauline, were so eager to hear the next part of the Talking Pony's adventures that they asked their parents' permission to have a picnic all to themselves. At first the parents did not like to have them go alone, but when they learned that the girls meant to go in the pony carriage with the Russian pony, they gave their consent, making the condition that Pat, the stableman, should be near them. But, said Lola, that would spoil it all. We don't want him along. We wish to be entirely by ourselves. We can be, Pauline suggested, for we can go to the ten-acre pasture near the old red bridge, and Pat can go fishing. He loves to fish, and when he's once busy with his rod and line, he will be as good as deaf, dumb, and blind, and yet he'll be near if anything happens. So they ran to the stable yard to see whether Pat was willing. They told him of their plan, and he dropped everything, and at once began to dig for bait. "'Tis what I'd like best,' said he, as he turned up the dark earth and picked out the squirming bait." There's a big fish in the dark hole below the old bridge that's no friend of mine. Bad luck to his speckled back. He's broke three lines on me and laughed in me face, so he has. Why, Pat, Pauline exclaimed, I didn't know fish could laugh. No more did I, miss, was Pat's reply. But if he didn't laugh, he did the best he could, and it was an ugly grin he gave me. Sure, he's lived on the bait I've brought him, and grown fat on it, so he has. Me mouth has watered for him these two months. So run away with you, while I put the pony to the cart, and get me lines and hooks ready for the old spalpeen in the river. Back ran the girls to the house, and Bridget, the cook, filled a basket with sandwiches, apple turnovers, and other good things, not forgetting plenty of sugar for the pony. Just as the cover was neatly fastened to the heavy basket, Pat came driving up to the door with Galopoff and the pony carriage. In they tumbled, and off they rattled, Galopoff's little hoofs beating the hard road like drumsticks, and then they spun through the village street and down the road to the river as if they were trying to catch a train. When they came to the ten-acre pasture, Pat got out and took down the bars, and Lola drove Galopoff over the soft grass to the riverside, where there was a clump of big chestnut trees to make a pleasant shade. Unharness, Galopoff, please, said Lola to Pat, and in a few minutes the pony was free to scamper over the fresh green grass. 
Away he went, tossing his head, whinnying, and even kicking up his heels when he was at a safe distance. As the girls stood watching him, Galopoff suddenly rolled over on his back two or three times, and then came trotting toward them. Meanwhile, Pat had wasted no time in making ready his fishing tackle and departed at once to see whether he couldn't catch the fish that had laughed at him. As Galopoff came near enough, Pauline said, Now, Galopoff, I do hope this is one of your talking days, for we do so want to hear more of your adventures. As she spoke, she held out two lumps of sugar, and Galopoff took them very politely from her hand and ate them slowly. While he seemed to be thinking over what she said, then he coughed softly and spoke, I don't like your saying one of my talking days. I can talk whenever I choose. I told you so once, and I don't care to say things twice. Horses are not like men. We have to keep our own laws, not yours. I tell you the truth when I think best, and I tell you stories when I feel that way. It's more convenient. What are your laws like? asked Lola. Oh, Galopoff answered, it would take too long to tell you but I'll recite a few. They are in rhyme, you know. Why are they in rhyme? asked Pauline. To make them sound sweet and easy to remember, said the pony. They are in horse language, of course, but I've put them into English. How clever of you, exclaimed Lola. Why did you do it? Just for something to think about, answered Galopoff. You have to think of something while you're standing in the stable, you know. It would be very dull there with nothing to look at but a motto or something like that. The little girls looked troubled, and Pauline spoke up quickly. Do tell us some of the laws. Very well, said Galopoff, but first I must take one more roll to refresh my memory. So away he went, and in a moment was on his back with all four hooves in air. "'My, how scratchy and nice this ground is!' he exclaimed, as he came trotting back. "'I don't wonder you speak of the nice rolls you have in the morning.' "'But those are things to eat,' said Lola. "'Well, I didn't know,' said Galopoff, a little confused. "'Never mind. Here are some of the horse laws. "'Keep your eyes upon the track. Ears are meant for turning back. "'Go up hills with gentle pace.' Down hills never run a race. On a journey, strike your gait. Keep it up, and don't be late. In double team, pull half the load. Leave your mate full half the road. Then there's another that's very short and easy to remember. It goes this way. Good steed, great speed, rich feed. I think I like that best of all. But Galopoff, said Lola, we want to know about your little Russian master, the young prince. You remember you left him in Siberia when you joined the circus and came to America. So I did, Galopoff replied. Well, after the circus had given many performances in Russia and in Europe, I heard the manager talking about trying a trip across the ocean. And then I made up my mind that it wouldn't do for me just to go with the circus people without making it somewhat easier for my little master to come after me. I knew that I must earn some money, which was easy enough for a trick pony as talented as I was, and also that I must send the money to my little master. Now this was not so easy, for, clever as I am, why, Galopoff, said Pauline, you shouldn't say that. It's not polite to praise oneself. It's polite for horses, Galopoff insisted. Why, we have to. It's not polite for us to praise one another. We just say what we think. Don't you think that the best way? I don't know, Pauline replied. Perhaps it is. Anyway, you are clever. So very likely it's no harm to say so. Never mind me, but go on. So Galopoff went on. Clever as you say I am, I hope that's better. I, for a long time, could not see how I was to make the manager pay me my salary. If I had had any master, he would have taken the money for me, you know. But since I was just a stray pony, so the manager thought, why, I suppose he said to himself that I was his and must work for nothing. 
At last I hit upon a really bright idea. There was one act I did in the circus in which I had to pick out letters and spell words for the manager, who acted as ringmaster. He would ask me questions, and I would take the letters from the ground and answer them by spelling words. So one night, just as... But Galopoff was interrupted. Pat came running back from the river, waving a big fish at the end of his line, and crying out, Here's the fish that laughed in me face! End of chapter 5 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 6 of Galopoff the Talking Pony This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. Pal 90 Galopoff the Talking Pony by Tudor Jenks Chapter 6 The Picnic and Galopoff's Story When Galopoff was thus interrupted, he forgot himself for a moment and said hastily, Botheration! As soon as Pat heard the word, he dropped the fish he was carrying, and stood staring at the pony with his jaw dropped and an expression of amazement. "'Be the powers!' said Pat when he could speak. "'Did you hear him? The little horse said botheration or something like it, as sure as me name's Patrick. What kind of a land is this in which the fish can laugh in me face and the horses talk?' Now the little girls didn't know what to say. They were afraid that if grown people found out that Galopoff could talk, it would put an end to all their fun. Still, they couldn't think what to say without saying what wasn't true. And they were not the sort of girls who do that. So, very wisely, they said nothing. But Galopoff was not so slow-witted. In knocking about the world, he had certainly brightened his wits. So the little girls were amazed to hear him half say and half whinny, something like this. Bother wee uh, wee uh, wee It began like a word, but it certainly ended with the horsiest kind of a whinnying neigh. Pat looked puzzled with his eye fixed on the pony and his mouth drawn down at the corners. Then when the neigh came, Pat said, So t'was neighing you were. You're that sensible that I thought you were talking. Let this teach you, young ladies, how easy it is to be deceived. Maybe the fish didn't laugh then, suggested Lola. Maybe not, Pat answered with a grin. But it's all one now, for it is too late to put him back. So we'll forgive him his impudence, and cook him for lunch. Then Pat built a bright fire of crackling sticks and made a bed of embers. Wrapping the fish in leaves, he put him into the hot ashes. When the fish was cooked, all the skin stuck to the leaves, and the fish was the most delicious morsel that could be imagined. Well, exclaimed Pat as he polished the last bone, a good fish needs no dish. Now I'll go see if I can't catch one of his brothers. Why? asked Pauline. Haven't you had enough? I've had plenty of fish, but not enough of fishing, Pat answered, as he rose and walked away towards the river. As soon as he was out of sight, Galopoff came strolling back again, nibbling bits of grass by the way. Oh, Galopoff, exclaimed Lola, you nearly got caught that time. Pat surely heard you. What would you do if he found out you could speak? But Galopoff made no answer. He put down his little nose upset the sugar bowl, and helped himself to three big lumps. "'Sugar is a great invention,' he remarked. "'I think it is perfectly sweet. Let me see, where was I?' "'You were telling about how you used the letters in the circus to—' "'Ah, yes, I remember,' said Galopoff. "'I waited until the ringmaster asked me what I'd like to have. Usually I would pick out the letters O-A-T-S, which I'm told spell oats.' But this time I picked out another set of letters and put them down in a bunch. The ringmaster didn't know what I was about and didn't know what to do. And while he was making up his mind, I arranged the letters to read like this. Pay me my money or I won't work. 
Then the people cheered and laughed and made a great noise. The ringmaster gave me the signal to go on, but I sat down and pointed with one hoof to the words I'd spelled. Then he tried to get me to leave the ring, but I would not budge. So he lost his temper and raised his big whip to lash me. As soon as he did this, I whirled round and gave two swift kicks. One knocked off his hi-hat and the other sent his whip flying. Then I whirled about and sat down again, pointing to my words. My, but he was scared. He came up to me and said, I think you're bewitched. How much do you want? I went to the letters and spelled out, 150 roubles, 10 gold pieces. He went out of the ring and soon returned with money in a little canvas bag. He threw it down, I picked it up in my teeth, and walked quietly out of the ring. When I was outside, they tried to take the money from me, but... You never saw me in a temper. Never, said the little girls. I hope you never will, said Galopoff solemnly. It is a terrible sight. Why, when they tried to take away my hard-earned wages, I was roused into a fury. Even the lion tamer shook in his shoes and begged them to let me go. I must have kicked eight ways at once, and what I stood on meanwhile, I'm sure I don't know. They all made way for me, and in an instant I dashed out of the circus tent, and away I went as if a pack of wolves were after me. But I didn't forget to carry my precious bag of gold pieces safely in my teeth the whole time. In a very short time, I was outside of the town, and free. In fact, as soon as I was clear of the streets, I went flying over a fence into the fields. And then I was safe from recapture. But how could you get the money to your little master? asked Lola. He was far away in Siberia. That's a long story, said Galopoff. The first thing I did was to find my cousin, Cantero. He was in a town not very distant, so travelling only at night and hiding myself in the woods by day, I soon reached him. I told him all about the circus and gave him full directions how to find the town where it was. I don't see how, said Pauline. That always puzzles me. Horses seem to know the way everywhere. Please tell us how it is done. Galopoff coughed a little stiffly. Then he said, My dear children, it gives me great pleasure to amuse you, but there are certain things we horses are forbidden to tell human creatures. That is one of them. And so you really must excuse me. Certainly, answered Pauline. But there is another thing. When we, uh, that is, when you wore that motto, you said you couldn't read. So how could you spell out those words? Pardon me, I said I could read Russian. And this, if you remember, was in Russia. I translated it into English. Oh, said Pauline, that is true. But, said Galopoff quickly, here comes the fisherman so we'll just put off the rest of the story till another time. And when Pat returned, he harnessed up the pony, packed up the picnic things, and away they all trotted home again. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Galopoff the Talking Pony This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Galopoff the Talking Pony by Tudor Jenks Chapter 7 Rescue of the Russian Prince Perhaps the most comfortable talk the little girls ever had with the pony was the one following the day of the picnic. Lola and Pauline had gone to spend the afternoon in a rustic summer house at the lower end of their own grounds, a place much enjoyed by the little girls and the caterpillars. Here the girls brought their books and their work to have a long, quiet afternoon together. For a time they worked in silence, one at a piece of patchwork and the other at a piece of embroidery. Then they began to talk, and gradually came to the subject of Galopoff's adventures. The worst of it is, said Pauline, that he all the time gets off the subject. What I want to know about is how he came to live here with you. He's always giving hints about it, but he never comes right out and tells a plain, straightforward story. Well, how can I? said Galopoff, putting his head in through the window. There is always somebody around, catching fish, or something to interrupt. 
But Pat has gone to town, Lola answered. It is his day out. Nobody is likely to come here. We have our work, and we will listen patiently if you'd like to go on. It is hard to tell a short story, said Galopoff. So many things keep getting in the way, and they are all so interesting. Now, you remember, I had just sent my cousin, Cantero, to take my place in the circus. Of course he couldn't do as well, but I couldn't help that. And the next thing was to carry the money to my little master. That was something of a puzzle at first. You see, I could not very well travel over miles of road with a bag of heavy gold coins in my mouth, even if there had been no danger of losing them, or of having them taken away from me. So I decided that I must put the money in some shape in which it could be carried more safely and more easily. The next question was how to do this. After thinking it all out very carefully, I made a plan. I don't trust grown-up human beings very often, because they are surprised or frightened when they hear an animal talk, but I always get along well with children. So I made friends with a little boy on the farm where my cousin lived, and when we were good friends, I began to do little tricks for him, such as bowing, kneeling, rolling over, playing dead, and so on. This made him think that I was quite intelligent. Here Galopoff could not help laughing to himself, and the children laughed too. Then he went on. Next, I pretended to try to speak, and easily led him to teach me to talk. It was wonderful to see how quickly the boy taught me to say easy Russian words, such as oves, or oats, dom, house, and how rapidly I learned to say even simple sentences. Meanwhile, I made inquiries from the other animals about the place, and I found the boy was an honest little fellow and could be trusted. At last, when we could talk a little freely, I sent him to change my gold pieces, at different times and places in town, into paper money. And then I made him fold all the bills up into a small, tight roll, which he tied very securely in among the thick locks of my white mane. He was a nice boy, said Pauline warmly. Indeed, he was, Galopoff agreed. But I gave him one piece of gold for himself. That was nice of you, exclaimed Lola. Indeed, it was. Galopoff agreed again, but I'm naturally generous. Now that I was ready for the journey, I bade Boris, the boy, goodbye. And off I set for Siberia, travelling at night, hiding by day, swimming the rivers that came in my way, sometimes chased by wolves or by men, losing the road again and again, uphill and downhill, by dale and by wood, getting to eat whatever I could. Why, Galopoff, exclaimed Pauline, do you know you're talking poetry? Galopoff shut his eyes very modestly and nodded, to show he had heard but didn't like to be interrupted, and went straight on, sometimes through deserts or deep drifts of snow, past dreary villages all in a row, in a long swinging gallop or a good steady trot, taking my rest in some desolate spot but always asking the horses I met whether I'd come to Siberia yet. So I went on till I came to the place where I gazed with delight on my young master's face. Both the girls were so delighted that they clapped their hounds loudly. Galopoff gave a great jump when they did this and shied as if scared. Don't do that again, please, he exclaimed. I'm not frightened exactly, but it came so quick. One of the horses I didn't tell you is this. First shy, then ask why. Now, why did you clap your hands? We were so glad you found your master, said Lola, and it came so quick. It has to come quick in poetry, said Galopoff. But I didn't know people clapped their hands except in circuses, so it startled me a little. Well, I came at last to the mines where my little master was at work, and I can tell you I felt sorry for him. He had never heard me speak, but I had no time to prepare him. I just waited until he was a little way from the rest of the men at work, and then I came galloping up to him. Get on my back quick, I cried. I'm your own pony, Galopoff. Jump on, quick, quick. Well, he was scared out of his seven senses, but just then he heard one of the guards shout, and he jumped on my back, and poof, away we flew. Ping, 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 came the bullets from the guard's rifle, but I ran zigzag, and we were hit only once. 
See, I have the scar on my shoulder. Galopoff showed a white strip where the hair didn't grow by touching it with his nose. Then how we did go. It was neck or nothing, and soon the guard, having emptied his rifle, ran to his horse and put after us. Oh, I tell you, children, that was a good race. But I had been travelling for weeks, and the poor fat horse of the guard had no chance at all. His hoofbeats began to sound fainter and fainter, and I shouted out to him in horse talk, It's no use, old slow coach. You'd better stumble if you want to save yourself trouble. He must have been a clever and good-natured horse, for he took my hint at once, and I heard him go slithering down all in a heap. So the chase was over, and I got a good start. If my master had tried to guide me, we should have been lost, that is, caught, for he would have gone by the regular roads. But I told him what to do, and he let me have my own way. When we came near a big town, I made him get down and hide, while I went in to find him some clothes. I soon saw a tailor's shop, where there were some clothes on the counter, and, rushing in, I seized them in my teeth, and then, calling out, Don't move! For your lives! I was off again, before they understood what had happened. The tailor probably thought I was a black demon. Anyway, I never saw or heard of him again. Back I went to my little master, who was hiding in a clump of trees, and, while he was putting on the clothes, which were a very bad fit, by the way, I had a long talk and explained everything. Besides, I told him where my money was, and he soon had it safely in his pocket. Then we separated, because it was not safe for us to travel together, and I have not seen him since. But first I told him that I was going to America to find your father, and that he must make his way to me afterwards. This he promised to do, since he believed that all the rest of his family were somewhere in the United States. Next time, I'll tell you how I carried out my part of our bargain. Isn't it pleasant to have Pat out of the way? Just as he said this, Galopoff looked around, and he was off like a shot, for Pat was seen dressed in his wrinkled Sunday suit, coming to call Lola and Pauline in to their dinner. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Galopoff the Talking Pony. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian King. Galopoff the Talking Pony by Tudor Jenks. Chapter Eight: The Automobile. It was a long while before the children had so good a talk with Galopoff again. In fact, the pony besides being the children's pet, was a valuable little worker on the estate, and he had his tasks to do, like the rest of the world. Just after the summer house story, it happened that there came a busy time for the pony, and he was trotting to town, or to the station and back, from morning to night. Besides, even when Galopoff was at leisure, he was tired, and did not care to talk. But suddenly this busy time came to a queer stopping place, and Galopoff had more spare time than he cared for. It happened in this way. Lola's father, though he was very fond of horses, took to reading advertisements about electric carriages and other machines for travelling, and finally bought one in order to experiment with it. It was a little two-seated automobile that looked like a particularly ugly big black bug and puffed like a bull with a cold in his head. Galopoff was disgusted with it. He walked around it three times when it was first brought into the stable yard, made a queer snorting noise, and then went disgustedly to his stall and moped there for the rest of the day. The next morning, Lola's father invited her to go out riding in the automobile, but she said it looked so cross and so stupid that she didn't care to go. Pauline, on the contrary, thought it would be delightful to ride in the new machine. And so it was arranged that she should go instead, and that Lola should ride Galopoff alongside. Are you afraid of the queer machine? Lola whispered as she smoothed out Galopoff's top knot. Afraid? Pooh, Galopoff answered just under his breath. I'm not scared of it, if that's what you mean. I'm only afraid of anything that has no sense. That gym crack... It's like a stone rolling downhill. It goes wherever chance takes it. 
My father has sense, Lola objected. Oh, yes, replied Galopoff in the same low tone. But he hasn't the strength that thing has. Two heads are better than one. The brains and the force go together in a horse. There was no time to say more, for just then Lola's father and Pauline came out, climbed into the seat of the automobile, and the procession started. Galopoff contented himself with keeping behind the automobile at first, but the vapour from it made him sneeze, so he put on more speed and went ahead of it, and a little to one side. Nothing of importance happened during the outward ride, but they came home by another road that made it necessary to cross a railway. When they approached the crossing, Galopoff's ears went sharply forward. He stood still, looked and listened, as he always did when coming to a track. Lola saw and heard nothing, and was about to urge Galopoff forward, when suddenly there came the whistle of a locomotive, and of course they stopped. The automobile just then got out of order. Something cracked or burst or stretched, and although Lola's father did his best to stop it, the machine came down a little hill, headed straight for the approaching train. Seeing that they were helpless, Lola's father was just about to seize Pauline and throw himself out upon the road, when he heard a strange voice calling sharply, Hold tight and sit still! Without thinking, he obeyed, and Galopoff came galloping up to the automobile, turned about like a little whirligig, and pressed his haunches against one side of the automobile near the front end. It was a hard struggle, but the sturdy little pony succeeded in turning the heavy machine so that it ran bump into the embankment at the side of the road, just as the train shot past. The automobile stood with its nose pushed into the soft earth and both its driving wheels moving around, as if they were doing any good. How Lola and her father and Pauline petted the brave pony, and how proud and happy he looked all the while. It was not until they started for home, leaving the ugly bug wagon to buzz itself out against the bank, that they found out that Galopoff had hurt himself. He could not help walking lame, so Lola had to walk home with the others, Galopoff painfully limping along behind. As soon as they reached home, a veterinary was sent for, and declared Galopoff was not seriously hurt, but must have complete rest for at least a week. During this quiet time, Galopoff was often visited by his two little friends, and when he was nearly recovered, he told them the story of his life, after leaving his little master. I went back, he said, to the circus people, partly because it seemed the best way to make the voyage to America, and partly because I really enjoyed the life. What did they say when you came back? asked Lola. Oh, I just strolled into the tent one evening, after the performance, and sniffed around to find Cantero. We rubbed noses, and he was really delighted to see me. I questioned him as to how he had found the circus life, and learned that he was delighted with it. His master had come to take him back to the farm, but the manager had offered so good a price for his services that it was arranged that Cantero should stay. When the manager came in and saw me, he was quite nervous at first, but I borrowed Cantero's box of letters and spelled out a few sentences that made it all right again. We arranged that both Cantero and myself should remain with the circus and he promised to take us both to America when the show went there the next year. We had a very delightful time together. We were both well and were kindly treated, for we proved a great attraction to the spectators, the children often throwing big wreaths of flowers into the ring after our grand act. What was your grand act? asked Pauline. A pretty thing I invented, Galopoff answered. It was a boxing match with gloves, on our forefeet, of course, that wound up with a Russian peasant dance in costume. It was very bewitching, I assure you, and always brought thunders of applause. There's little to tell about the experiences we had until we came to America, though there was one lively time when the Bengal tigress 
escaped from her cage, and Cantero and I drove her back again with torches held in our mouths, and another little adventure with an ugly baby elephant. But it would take forever to tell all those little incidents. I wish you would, exclaimed Lola. Some other time, perhaps, Galopoff said. But now I must go on to my American tour. We came over in grand style, Cantero and I, in specially arranged box stalls. And I should have enjoyed the voyage exceedingly. But Cantero was seasick, and I had to take care of him. When we landed in New York, we went in a grand procession up Broadway, and we two ponies, in golden harness and scarlet plumes, were wildly cheered on every block. Soon after, we began to give performances, at first in the cities, and afterward in small towns. And when we came to this town, you know what happened? Yes, we know, said Pauline, but we want you to tell us again. Very well, said Galopoff. But not today. Here comes Pat with my supper. And if you'll excuse my saying so, I'm really hungry and tired. Tomorrow, Pat has to go to the city, you know. So come early, and I'll tell you another of my adventures. Good night, children, and pleasant dreams. Good night, dear Galopoff, they answered, just as Pat came to the stall. It's very polite you are to the little horse, Pat remarked. But, by the powers, he's a little gentleman, and he deserves it. End of chapter 8、Chapter、Nine of Gallop of the Talking Pony This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Subhash Chandra. www.subhashsings.com. Gallop Off, The Talking Pony by Tudor Jenks. Much Ado About an Attic. The next day was Saturday, and neither Pauline nor Lola had to go to school. They made up their minds on Friday afternoon that they would get up early on Saturday morning and have a nice long day, and you may be sure that Gallop Off was not forgotten. In the plans they made for spending their holiday. But Friday evening after dinner, Pauline became deeply interested in a new book, and Lola was quite as much absorbed in a new puzzle, and so, in spite of their resolve to go to bed early, they really sat up later than usual, excusing themselves by the thought that the next day was a holiday. The consequence was that they did not rise with the lark. Or with any of the birds, but came straggling down to breakfast after everything was cold, and more or less tumbled about by the older people. Besides, there was only one fish cake upon the platter, and each insisted that the other should have it, and made so much fuss in trying to be unselfish that they quite lost their tempers with each other. Lola's father, who was sitting near the table looking over his newspaper. Finally, began to laugh at the two girls and said, "Girls, wouldn't it be more generous if one of you should let the other be unselfish? There is such a thing, you know, as being selfish about being unselfish. Suppose you divide that lone fish ball carefully in the middle and then talk about something else." The advice seemed good and was taken. After breakfast, Lola proposed that they go up into the old attic to play for a while. The sun was very hot, and the attic, while not dark, was much less bright and dazzling than their usual playground under the trees. Pauline said that she would love to go through some of the old trunks in the attic rooms and look at the old clothes and other relics stored away. Besides, the attic was always a spicy, mysterious sort of a kingdom, full of queer, dark corners and musty furniture. And now and then, a wasp would go to bumping his head against the window panes, just to keep one from going to sleep. And there was a strangeness about that part of the house, so that to be there made one feel that a holiday was different from other days, the just ordinary days. As the girls were going toward the attic stairs, Lola had a sudden and brilliant idea. "Oh, Pauline," she said, 
I have just thought of the most splendid thing, if we can do it. And I think we can. Really, I don't see why we shouldn't. He often and often has been downstairs. Lola, said Pauline, do you know that you are talking perfect nonsense? I know I am, Lola answered, laughing. But really, this is such fun. What is? Pauline asked. Why? I mean to ask my father whether we can take Galapov up into the attic. I don't see why we shouldn't. Just think, we have had him for such a long time and the poor fellow has never once been up in our attic. I think it's a perfect ridiculous thing but he is as sensible as he can be. Why shouldn't we go see him and ask him? We ought to, of course, Pauline answered. I wouldn't even think of doing it without his permission. Without whose permission? Lola asked, after gazing at Pauline with a puzzled look. Without your father's permission, to be sure. But I meant to ask Galapov, Lola said. I must ask father, of course, but after I ask him, I am going to find out whether Galapov is willing to climb all these stairs. I will tell you what we will do, said Pauline. You go ask your father and I will go out to the stable and ask Galapov. In that way, we shall save time and then we can meet and report what they both say. This seemed a good plan and so they arranged to carry it out. They separated in the front hallway, Lola to go to her father's study and Pauline to make a visit to the little Russian pony. When Lola knocked at the study door, her father, instead of saying come in as he usually did, asked, Who is there? Lola answered, It's Lola, father. What do you want? He asked. And Lola, with her errand in mind, replied, talking a little slowly, Father, I want Galapov. But my child, came the answer. I haven't him. Do you think I keep him in my vest pocket or use him as a paperweight? You will find him in the stable or somewhere about the place. Can't I come in? Lola asked. Certainly, come in. So Lola opened the door and found her father busy over a pile of papers upon his table. They were of various colors and sizes and Lola knew that he was making out checks for the monthly bills at which work he never liked to be disturbed. So she tried to make her request as short as she could. Father, said she, a little confused, I want to know whether you have any objection to Galapov's being in the attic. He dropped his pen and turned about suddenly in his chair. Galapov in the attic? How in the world did he get into the attic? He didn't ever, said Lola. I didn't say he did. But he never will, her father said, trying to quiet her. She was confused and seeing this, he thought she was worried. Galapov knows his place too well. You needn't fret about it, dear. And even if he did get up into the attic, he wouldn't be likely to hurt himself. He has too much sense to jump out of the windows. Besides, why should he go up there? But father, dear, said Lola, as her father turned again to his pen and ink. Please listen. I only asked if you had any objection to his being in the attic. And then you said, he wasn't there. Her father answered. Why should I object until it happens? But would you object if it did happen? Asked Lola, who was now all tangled up in the misunderstanding. To her father this question seemed so absurd that he began to wonder whether there was anything wrong with Lola, whether she was out of her head or fever. Come here, dear, he said, and Lola, not knowing what he wanted, came and stood close beside him. Let me see your tongue. Greatly surprised by this request, the little girl held out her tongue and her father examined it carefully. Then he felt of her forehead. Apparently there was nothing out of the way so far as the tongue and forehead went and Lola's father looked puzzled. Then he said quite solemnly, Lola, my child, why do you talk so queerly this morning? Have you been having unpleasant dreams of Galapov? Nightmares? Pony nightmares, so to speak? Lola did not know whether to laugh or to cry and at last began to laugh rather hysterically and then said, Father, I think you have some queer notion about me and I don't see why. I just came to see 
whether you would mind very much if Pauline and I were to take little gallop off up into the attic for a while this morning. That's all. We don't think it will do him any harm, do you? Her father laughed when he saw how queerly he had misunderstood her question. Then he began to think it over and at last said, Well, Lola, if you will go very carefully on the stairs and do not interfere with Galapov in any way while he is climbing, I think I will say yes. But do not follow the pony. You girls go up first, then if he falls at least he won't hurt you. I don't think he will fall or if he does probably he won't hurt himself because he is a spry on his feet and he has been a trick pony in a circus. Thanking her father with a hug, Lola ran away to find out how Pauline had succeeded in her talk with Galapov. Meanwhile, after leaving Lola, Pauline had crossed the sunny stable yard and had entered the cool dark stable where Galapov was standing in his neat little stall. She went up to him and standing just outside said pleasantly, Good morning, Galapov. I hope you have had a good night's rest. Galapov made no reply but tossed his head impatiently as if to shake off a fly. So Pauline said, speaking a little louder and going nearer to the stall, What's the matter, Galapov? Are you cross? Still the pony made no reply. Pauline did not know what to do. Seeing a water bucket near, she turned it over and sat down upon it, finding it a very comfortable seat, although it wobbled a little if she did not sit perfectly still. After waiting a few moments in silence and beginning to lose her temper, Pauline said sharply, Galapov, I have come out to see you and I think you might pay some attention to me. Then there came a well-known voice from the next stall but one. Sure, Miss Pauline, I never seen the beat of you two girls. You seem to think that the pony there has the sins of a Christian in his little noddle. It's good morning, Galapov, and a fine day it is, Galapov like as if you were calling on the minister. And it's the pretty manners you have, but why do you be wasting them on brute beasts and dumb creatures? At this Galapov must have lost his temper, for he made such a racket in his stall that Pat said, Hua, there, pony, and then explained to Pauline that the flies were that bothersome this hot spell, the poor houses got no rest. In a few moments, Pat came out of the stall and came up to where Pauline was sitting. You will be after excusing me, miss, he said. But may I be troubling you to let me have the reception chair you are occupying, so that I may draw some water at the pump? Pauline laughed, rose and let Pat take the bucket. No sooner had Pat left the stable than Galapov spoke. Such an ignorant fellow as that almost makes me sorry I am a horse. How would you like to spend your time listening to such talk as his? He calling me a brute beast? Why, that makes me more tired than climbing ladders in a circus? Galapov, said Pauline, I really beg pardon for calling you cross. But you see, I thought you wouldn't speak to me. Now I see why it was. But why do you mind speaking when Pat is here? Pat is a good-natured man. Don't you see? Galapov answered, that if I were to talk to Pat, that Pat would talk to me. Why, he even talks to himself as it is. Often he goes mumbling about the stable or singing Irish songs until I wish he was the dumb creature he thinks me. But Pat is not such a bad fellow. Galapov went on. He is honest and looks after me well enough. I shall give him a good recommendation if he ever leaves. Galapov, Pauline interrupted, for she was afraid she would keep Lola waiting. I came this morning to see whether you would like to come and visit Lola and me in the house. I wouldn't mind, Galapov replied. That is, if there are no stairs to climb. Goodness, said Pauline. But that's just it. We want you to climb all the way to the top floor. We were going to spend the morning in the attic. It is splendid up there. There are trunks and trunks just piled full of old clothes and things. It's great fun to look them over. Hum, Gallop snorted. I don't think old clothes are very interesting. If it was old harnessed now, it might be worth my while. 
It is so queer to see the queer old straps and buckles and all the contrivances that horses used to wear in the old days. But, Galopov, do come, Pauline begged. Lola wants to see you and she want me to see whether you would. We can tell stories and have a glorious time up there. That's all very well, said the pony. You can climb stairs easily. It's not so easy a matter for us four-legged folk, I can tell you. Oh, well, said Pauline slyly, we don't want to give you any trouble. Only we thought that stairs wouldn't be much to a trick pony who can climb ladders and fire off guns and jump through hoops all burning with flames. You used to do those things, didn't you, Galapov? Yes, I used to in my younger days. But I don't like stair climbing very much. The stairs are slippery, you know. Still, I could do it easily enough. Maybe Lola's father wouldn't like me to go tramping through the house. Oh, I don't think he will care. If he says he's willing, will you go? There is a fine view from the attic windows. Yes, I will come, said Galapov after thinking it over for a few moments while he chewed a wisp of straw. Whist, here comes Pat. Run away now and tell Lola that I will come if her father doesn't mind. Delighted to get the pony's consent, Pauline ran out of the stable and back to the house where she met Lola and told of her success. In a minute more, both girls were in the stable again, eagerly taking down the bar so that Galapov could follow them to the house. Where are you going with the pony? asked Pat. That's a secret, said Lola. But father says we may. We are going to take him to the house. That's all I will tell you. Go on with that? Pat answered, pretending to chase them out. I believe you are going to teach him to play the piano. Or maybe it's only a bit of embroidery for a fair. Faith, it's a set of skip graces a there and three of you. Why are you not at your lessons? Because it is Saturday, Pat, and that's a good why. Troth it is, away with S, and when the pony has learnt his scales, I will come up to the house in my Sunday best and sing the song. O patatis, there was more. It's a fine song with a chorus as good as itself. Away scampered the three scapegraces and climbed the front steps that led up to the piazza, Galopov's little hoofs making a queer hollow tapping on the boards. End of Much Ado About an Attic Recording by Subhar Chanda www.subharsings.com Chapter 10 of Gallop of the Talking Pony This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Subhash Chandar www.subharsings.com Gallop of the Talking Pony by Tudor Jenks A Cozy Talk in the Attic There said Galapov, when with some trouble but without an accident he had reached the very topmost step and stepped out upon the level attic floor. I don't think there are many ponies who could do that. But I have been taught that it is wrong to boast, Lola answered. So it is wrong for little girls, was Galapov's answer. It's no matter for horses. They know what they can do and what they can't do. And they just say it. That isn't boasting. I should think the reason was the same. Pollen remarked. It hurts the feeling of other horses to be reminded that there are things they cannot do the same as if they were people. Not at all, was the pony's reply. Horses have more sense. Did you ever hear of horse sense? Yes, said Pollen. Well, that's it. Horses know that a plow horse is one thing and a race horse is entirely different. They soon find out what they can do best and then they learn to do it in the very best way they can. 
it would be an excellent thing if you people did the same lola did not care much for talk of this kind so she resolved to change the subject she asked galopov how he liked the view the pony walked over to the attic window and stretching down his neck looked out and for a moment or two did not speak then he said i like them both but i think the right hand view the best how do you mean asked lola galopov turned his head so as to bring one eye on her why he said i always see two views at once one out of each eye we horses see twice as much as people do when we stand in the middle of a field we can see nearly all around us at once same as the birds now i wonder if you ever thought of that both of the little girls had to admit that it was a new idea to them that is the way with people galopov went on they seem to think animals are like themselves which is absurd of course in some way men are smarter than most animals yet it seems to be that there are some creatures who prove themselves cleverer than men take cats for instance they have all the good things of life and yet they never do any work at all they are fed and taken care of by men and all they are expected to do is to catch mouses and rats to catch what asked paulin in surprise mouses and rats but that isn't right said paulin why certainly it is right galopov insisted what business have the mouses but we say mice paulin interrupted oh that's what you mean is it galopov said with a hoarse laugh I thought you meant that it wasn't right for cats to catch mouses. I mean mice. I never did care much for plurals anyway, especially mouse plurals. One mouse at a time is enough for anybody. The squashy little things. Why gallop off? said Lola. I didn't know there were any animals you don't like. I thought you were fond of all sorts. Not at all. my horrid little things i think because they are all the time trying to get into my food you don't like worms in your apples and chestnuts do you both girls admitted that they preferred the apples and chestnuts just as they came from the tree well it is the same with me kelapoff explained i don't like mice to go nibbling over my dinner So that's why I am glad to have the cats catch them and scrunch their little bones. Galopov looked quite fierce when he said this and the little girls thought it would be wise to change the subject. What other animals are there that you don't like? Lola inquired as she and Paulin seated themselves on top of a very dilapidated old leather trunk. I don't care much about elephants. Galopov remarked after a few moments hesitation. Why not? Elephants are big and they are so restless. Did you ever see how they go swing, swing, swinging to and fro instead of standing still as a sensible horse does for instance? They never are still and that squirmy trunk of theirs is another thing I don't like. It seems to me to be so inquisitive. It goes poking around into men's pockets looking for sugar. while a self-respecting pony has to stand quietly waiting until somebody thinks how good a piece of sugar tastes to a pony after he has been doing tricks climbing stairs for instance lola laughed at this and drew two or three lumps of sugar from a pocket and galopov crunched these with great satisfaction then the girls found a bundle of ears of corn and gave some of the kernels to the pony to chew So altogether they turned out to be some refreshments at their little picnic. Pauline was usually the one to suggest a new idea for she was of rather a restless disposition and fond of change. So presently she told Galopov that there were so nicer places in which to tell stories than an attic and asked him whether he wouldn't like to go on with his account of his adventures. I don't mind, he said. In fact, I feel it is in a certain sense my duty to see that the strange circumstances that have happened to me in my wandering life 
should not be forgotten some day when you are lola a grown up you may become writers and in that case you undoubtedly will record my remarkable career that the young whether of mankind or of horses may profit by my example and experience when the pony talked like this the little girls never enjoyed it much it seemed to them altogether too like school or church or a lecture but galopoff was a good-hearted little pony in spite of his excellent opinion of himself and so the children simply listened politely to such speeches and then forgot them just as soon as ever they could which was pretty soon yes galopoff went on clearing his throat which was a little husky because of the corn he had eaten you are certainly entitled to hear the continuation of the remarkable vicissitudes of fortune that resulted in the curious chain of circumstances which now galopoff lola broke in please save those big words for the big people and give us the little words that we can understand i am sure that i have no idea what a something institute is very good little girl the pony answered good naturedly but i thought it would do you no harm to learn a few big words still i can use the little words just as well let me see where was i in my adventures why you had come to america and had been in the grand procession up broadway and had commenced to go about the country giving exhibitions and and i don't know exactly what came next said paulin but that is no matter it isn't a lesson you know so go right on anywhere galopoff looked at paulin as if he wasn't very greatly pleased with this remark but after a short silence he evidently made up his mind to go on even if the children had forgotten some parts of his story perhaps the most convenient place to go on from he remarked is just before i met your father lola as paulin has said we went about the country giving performances and meeting with great success everywhere being crowned with flowers fed by ladies and children with sweetmeats and having a most delightful time altogether yet i was not content i wished to find out the american gentleman who had so kindly bought me when they tried to sell me away from my little master and wherever we went as i galloped or trotted around the ring i kept a sharp lookout to see if by chance i could not see his face again do you remember the day when i found him yes said lola clapping her hands i remember it very well but still i wish you would tell us about it i like true stories anyway and especially i like the ones that i have been part of so go on galopoff i will he said we came at last to the town that is near your home of course i did not then know that your father lived here but the morning of the day on which we were to exhibit here something happened that made me think it was going to be a lucky day for me do you know what that was no lola answered i don't believe you ever told me what it was you know how they make a circus ring not exactly why they clear away a round place and then they build up a kind of hard bank of turf around it what is that for asked paulin that is so that when the horses go round and round they may be able to lean in toward the center if they didn't lean over that way they couldn't go around so fast and so steadily and if they didn't go steadily the riders would fall off but that isn't what i meant to tell you about they built this little bank out of turf and clay and as i trotted into the ring on that day to rehearse my great act known on the circus bills as the cossack pony rescues his wounded master oh tell us about that exclaimed paulin not now dears answered galopoff for i like to finish one thing at a time and the sun is getting rather low i shan't have more time then i need to tell the story as i was saying when i entered the ring i suddenly saw a four-leaved clover growing on a bit of turf at one side of the ring as soon as i had a moment during the act 
I walked over and picked up the little clover and held it in my lips during the rest of the rehearsal. We put them into our shoes, Paulin remarked. Horses don't need to do that, Galapov answered, for a horseshoe is lucky by itself. It is never good to mix two lucky things together, we believe. So I didn't put it into my shoe, but I hung it up carefully by my looking glass. By your looking glass? Paulin exclaimed laughingly. Certainly, Galapov answered very primly. I like to have my mane parted straight just as much as you do. And I can't trust the grooms to do it. And by the way, that reminds me, I wish you would buy me a looking glass the next time you go to town, Lola. Patrick often gets my mane or my forelock crooked and I would like to have you speak to him about it. Then if I have a mirror handy, or rather perhaps I should say hoofy, here Galapov either coughed or laughed. It was hard to tell which. Lola promised to buy the looking glass the very next time she was in town and Galapov resumed his story. Having found the four-leaved clover, I rather expected some good luck that day and so when I went into the circus ring, I was a little excited. And being a little excited, I did a remarkable thing. I made a mistake in my act. By the way, it was the same act that I was rehearsing when I found the four-leaved clover. I won't tell you all about it, but among other things, I had to take hold of the circus man that played the part of my wounded master and left him gently, pretending that it was to carry him off because enemies were coming. Usually, I was very careful to seize him by the coat collar. But this time, my mind was busy with other things and instead of catching hold of his collar, my eyes were wandering around among the audience and I caught hold of the poor fellow's hair to lift him. My, but it must have hurt. And how he did yell? Well, that made trouble. You ought to have heard the people laugh. Unfortunately, or fortunately perhaps, I should say we did not have our regular ringmaster that day. We had a new man who had taken the other's place only for a day or two. Now the regular man knew that on no account did I permit anyone to use a whip upon me. The new man didn't know that and when he saw what I had done and when he heard the laughing, he lost his temper and snapped his great whip at me. Just think of it. Galapov paused and looked at the children so that they might understand what an awful thing the ringmaster had done. What did you do? asked Paulin, leaning forward and looking very deeply interested. I galloped at him and scared him half out of his little wits, Galapov answered gleefully. And then before he knew what I was going to do, I seized the whip between my teeth, took it away from him, lashed him twice across the legs with it and then threw it down, stamped on it and broke it. Yes, I remember, said Lola, clapping her hands with delight. And then what a noise the people made, didn't they? exclaimed Galapov, as his eyes sparkled at the memory. You see, Paulin, he explained. Some of the audience thought I had done quite right and they applauded me while others thought I had turned ugly and would jump over among the seats and hurt some of the women and children. So while some were pleased, others were frightened and began to get up in order to go out. Some man shouted out, Get a whip and lash the little critter. What did he mean? asked Paulin. I don't wonder, you asked, Galapov answered in a dignified tone. But no doubt he meant that they should whip me. Then it was that I saw Lola's father for the first time since I had seen him in Russia. He stood up and speaking very calmly and sensibly and yet in a masterful way, he told the people to sit down and keep quiet. The pony is all right, he said. I have known him for several years. He is as gentle as a dove. Galapov snickered as he said this and added, Remember, children, I am giving his words, not my own. 
he is as gentle as a dove he said and all he needs is to be treated kindly then the ring master still angry over the loss of his whip said to your father lola oh yes said he it's all very well to stand over there and say the little demon is gentle but let's see you step over into the ring and say it i remember when he said that how angry father was lola remarked as galop of paused to munch the fag end of one of the sugar lumps no wonder galop of replied then your father answered him there before all those people by saying only the cruel need be cowardly and then he stepped down into the circus ring and came over to see me i can tell you i was glad that i had found him at last and when i was quite certain surely sure who it was i rushed at him in a way that made the silly ring master think i was going to eat your father up was he frightened paulin asked of course not lola answered indignantly he knew galopoff at once and he would just as soon think of being frightened at me when i rushed at him oh then we had a good time exclaimed galopoff i just danced up and down in my delight and really i believe your father was just as much pleased to see me he smoothed my mane and patted my nose and called me poor little fellow and other things like that until the people began to applaud and cry go on go on what did you do then paulin asked the performance went on and we went through all the regular acts just as usual except the poor ring master had to get another whip meanwhile i had brought out my box of letters and had spelled out for the manager behind the scenes of course the words i am going to leave what did he say lola inquired was he willing willing galop of repeated with some indignation did you ever know a manager who liked to lose his best actor in a busy time no of course not lola said soothingly what i meant to ask was did he say you might go he couldn't help himself said galopoff airily and he knew it you know the old proverb you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink the children nodded they had been fond of playing proverbs both the regular and the shouting kind and so they knew a great many then you can understand that a trick pony cannot be made to perform unless he wishes so he knew it was useless to oppose me and agreed to let me go of course it was hard for him but still i had made him plenty of money and he could afford to be generous but how did you come to be here at lola's home asked paulin perhaps lola can tell you better than i galopoff answered at least there are some things connected with it that she knows better than i i can tell how i asked father to buy him said lola but that will have to be for another time because the sun is getting very low and we must get ready for dinner besides i am sure galopoff must be tired and he has all those stairs to climb yes i would better be getting back to the stall galopoff agreed or poor patrick will be coming here to carry me down just then they heard a voice at the foot of the attic stairs and have you changed galop off into a flying horse and taken a trip to the stars it was patrick and the attic party was over end of a cozy talk in the attic recording by subhash chandra www.subhashsings.com Chapter 11 of Galopoff the Talking Pony This is a LibriVox recording All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain For more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Subhash Chandra www.subhashsings.com Galopoff the Talking Pony by Tudor Jenks Galopoff does some tricks It was some time before the children again had a talk with the little pony 
for you must not think that they had nothing else to do both had their lessons their music their gymnastics and their games as the rest of you have and galopoff also had his task to perform about the house and meanwhile without waiting for him to hear the story lola told paulin about the buying of galopoff from the circus people she had taken a great fancy to the little black creature with the white mane and white tail and luckily enough her father owed her a birthday gift that she had been saving up that is he had promised to give her a present and she had not yet made a choice so now when she longed to own the pony she begged that this might be the promised present when her father was sure that she knew her own mind and that it was not a mere passing fancy he bought the pony but at the same time he took care that lola should know that a living pet was a very different position from a new toy and that it was not to be neglected or forgotten as soon as it ceased to be new at first the danger was not in neglect and there was no fear that galopoff would lack exercise the delight of driving the gentle and spirited little nag was so great that lola found it hard to consent that he should now and then have a day of rest and after the newness of driving had been lost the discovery that galopoff could talk had come to given him an added charm pauline too found as much pleasure in the new pet as her cousin sometimes the children wondered whether they ought not to tell their parents about galopoff's talking powers but after thinking it well over they decided there was no harm in keeping the secret to themselves since there had never been in their conversation anything which they felt they ought to tell their elders wouldn't it be nice said pauline one day as they were walking down to galopoff's pasture if the pony should turn out to be a prince or something like that suppose he had been changed by some witch into the form of a pony and should be restored to his true shape in some magical way wouldn't it be just like a fairy book no i don't think i should like that at all said lola if he were to turn out a prince he would be just a boy or a young man and then i would lose my talking pony and i don't want to lose him at all i don't think he's anything but a pony paulin for you see he thinks like a horse and talks like a horse not like a man or boy at all he might be enchanted though paulin insisted i have read of cases like that and if he was in a magic charm of course he would act just like a horse but enchanted things always have something queer about them lola insisted there is always something different from the ordinary galopoff has a white mane and a white tail paulin replied i know lola said and little uncertainly but he told us how that happened and i believe him i know what i will do i will ask him whether he is just a pony or whether he is enchanted what's more i will ask him today he may not know paulin said shaking her head i believe he does know anyway let's ask him it will be fun to see what he says was lola's reply by this time they had reached the crooked gray old rail fence that marked off galopoff's pasture from the big 10 acre lot As soon as he saw them coming Galopoff turned his back and walked slowly off to the other side of the pasture cropping the grass as he went and acting as if he didn't see them Now look at him said Paulin laughing that's just pure mischief He wants you to call him if I were you I wouldn't say a word let's just act as if we came here only for fun to sit on the fence and talk Lola agreed and so the two girls pretended to be very busy in talking together but kept an eye on the pony to see what he would do and galopoff went on feeding without giving a sign that he saw them except that now and then he turned his head just enough to catch a glimpse of them out of one bright eye so the minutes went by and neither side would give in to fill up the time the girls began to play the game characters that is one would take a character living or dead real or made up and would answer the other's question as if she were really the imagined character Lola had taken the character of Jack Frost and Pauline found it a very hard one to guess because she could find out so little about him. She had found out that he made pictures and sometimes broke things if they were left out of doors, that he often prepared winter sports and so on. But she could not hit upon exactly the right character. Sometimes she thought it was Santa Claus, but that didn't fit because Jack Frost seemed to enjoy pinching children's cheeks. of fingers and toes and that it wasn't a bit like santa claus then she thought it was an arctic explorer because jack was so fond of northern climates in fact she was decidedly mixed up when suddenly she heard a voice behind her saying why don't you ask 
Pollen jumped in surprise. She had forgotten all about Galopoff for the moment, and the voice startled her. "Goodness me!" she exclaimed. "Was that you, Galopoff? How you scared me!" "I am sorry," the pony answered. "But I forgot to. I was interested in the game, and I spoke before I thought." but why don't you ask her whether he ever paints in colors well i will lola do you ever paint in colors no lola answered in the assumed character my pictures are always in pure white do they last long galopoff said no not usually sometimes though they last for a long time i know said galopoff I know what the character is and he galloped about shaking his head in delight What is it Polly asked Will you let him guess Lola I don't mind Lola said as Galopoff came back to them It's Jack Frost Galopoff said He is one of my old friends in Russia That's right said Lola and now you can take a character if you like Galopoff That's the rule of the game you know but i don't wish to play the game galopoff said games are all right for indoors but outdoors i would like something livelier lola has a question she wants to ask you said polin remembering that lola had promised to ask may i tell him lola no don't said lola i would rather ask him myself galopoff as we were walking down the road polin wondered whether you were really a pony or whether you were an enchanted prince or something magical like that and i said that i didn't believe you would mind if i asked you tell me are you just a plain pony of course i am not just a plain pony said galopoff with some indignation do you consider me plain no i am a talking pony and that is something very unusual and peculiar i can tell you and then too i am a trick pony I can do lots of tricks. Oh, won't you show us some? Pollen asked. You know that I never even saw you in the circus. I wish you would do some tricks right now. Of course I will. Galopoff answered promptly. You can be the audience and I will give you a little circus all to yourselves. Only you may not have come down here to see me. You may like best to go on with your game. you didn't say anything to me when you came i don't know even whether i am welcome both girls assured him that they had come to the pasture especially to see him and when he asked why they hadn't called him they had to explain how it was galopoff did not seem offended but was amused and good-naturedly agreed to go on and exhibit some of his tricks only said he of course i cannot do very much without the things i used to have in the circus Now I will show you how I used sometimes to come into the ring. Will one of you kindly play? You are a big brass band. This made the girls laugh and they didn't know what he meant. But he explained to them that he would like some music to march by. Do you know the Russian national hymn? Lola knew the tune having learned it at school and at Galopoff's request she hummed it as loud as she could at the same time beating time. upon the lower rail of the fence with her feet as soon as she caught the right measure galopoff trotted away and in a few moments he came back marching on his hind legs as he marched he waved his fore legs in the air and nodded his head with the music he looked very grand and marched as proudly as a veteran soldier both of the little girls clapped their hands with delight and as galopoff lowered himself to his fore legs again he looked very much gratified by the applause of his small audience of two many circus horses can do that he said and it is not so very much of a feat in fact i can do it just as easily with one of you on my back hop on lola and i will show you he backed or rather sidled up close to the fence lola jumped upon his back still humming the music and once more galopoff paraded as before then polin too must have her turn and the pony good-naturedly carried her also now galopoff said if you will give me a couple of minutes to catch my breath i shall be glad to show you something 
a little more difficult something that even very clever circus horses can never learn to do please move a little way off from the fence the two girls withdrew a short distance from the fence and then to their surprise galopoff climbed to the top rail and walked along the narrow bit of timber as surely and safely as if he were upon the level ground below nor was this all when he came to the post he climbed with all four hoofs close together to its top and then slowly wheeled around as if on a pivot until he was facing in the direction from which he had come there said he that's something difficult you may have seen an elephant do something of the kind but it is much harder for a horse with his tiny hoofs than it is for a great flat-footed heavy elephant i think that is splendid pollen exclaimed it must be very hard to do well it is certainly not easy galopoff replied seeming to be much pleased by the admiration he had won and if you like i will show you some other tricks the girls encouraged him and galopoff did a number of amusing feats he leaped the fence backward and forward several times he put down his head and turned a somersault he walked on three legs holding up one and pretending to be lame he waltzed to a whistle tune pollin being the performer and he trotted backwards which last performance he told them was so hard to learn that no other trick pony had ever been able to learn it at all cantaro my cousin galopoff explained was so eager to learn it that he used to practice it after every exhibition but he never could learn do it properly poor fellow in fact he usually tripped himself up and went sprawling but there is one thing i can do that i never showed anyone can you guess what it is both girls tried their best but could not think what trick galopoff meant you would never guess he said shaking his head but when i was in russia i learned to skate i did truly and you have no idea how hard it was for a four-footed animal to keep his balance on skates at last i got the hang of it and i used to enjoy it extremely i had learned the outside edge and the grape wine and some fancy figures when i left russia have you ever skated since lola inquired no answered galopoff You see in Russia my skating was done at home on my little master's estate where we had the lake all to ourselves but here I'm afraid it would draw a crowd and make a sensation besides if an immense throng of people were to gather to see me skate the ice would be likely to break and some of them might be drowned i hardly think it would be safe oh galopoff Lola exclaimed suddenly i have just had such a good idea that is it would be a good idea if you are willing to help what is that why can't we have a little private exhibition for some of our playmates a sort of small circus performance in which you can do tricks for us oh will you do it it would be such fun galopoff looked grave he seemed at first unwilling to carry out lola's plan he pawed the ground with his forefoot and his ears worked backward and forward as they always did when he was thinking hard meanwhile the girls kept silence waiting until he should decide i am not certain whether it would be a good thing he said at last let me take a good brisk run around the pasture to clear up my ideas so saying he kicked up his heels and away he went like the wind shaking his plumy white mane and waving his long tail but after he had been twice around the field he came back to say that he thought it could be managed if the older people should consent i'll make only one condition he said finally i must ask that patrick shall not be there he makes me uneasy i don't know just why but he does all right said lola and now let's go home 
come said galopoff hop on my back both of you and we will go home like a charge of cavalry and so they did end of galopoff does some tricks recording by subhash chandra www.subhashsings.com Chapter 12 of Galopoff the Talking Pony. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by Jaypal 90. Galopoff the Talking Pony by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 12. Mr. Gudgeon's Calls. Lola asked her father that very evening whether she might not have Galopoff give an exhibition for the benefit of her little friends. And how much shall you charge to see him? her father asked. Charge? repeated Lola indignantly. Why should I charge anything? My father, this is a little party. I shall just invite my friends to come and see me and my pony. What made you think that I would charge them? I didn't have any special reason, her father replied. Only I thought maybe you would have an admission of 5 pins or something of that sort. Isn't that the regular way? Not with me, Lola said with some spirit. I'm not going into the show business. This is just a party. And father, I almost forgot to tell you that Galopoff doesn't want Patrick there. Goodness, her father exclaimed. How in the world do you know that? Lola looked confused. She didn't like to tell her father that Galopoff had said so. and there didn't seem to be any way to escape from it but lola had always told her father the truth and so he had learned to trust her and when now she said plainly that she would rather not explain how she knew he concluded that she had some good reason and said no more the invitations were written and sent to a number of the very nicest girls lola and pauline knew in the neighborhood nearly all of them accepted for what little girl would be likely to refuse an invitation reading like this Lola and Pauline invite you to be present on the blank of blank from four until six at a private view of the tricks and accomplishments of the pony Galopoff, who has kindly consented to perform. Before the day set for the performance, however, something happened that seemed likely to prevent it. There was in the town near Lola's home a very fussy and meddlesome man by the name of Gudgeons. Somehow, Mr. Gudgeon saw the card of invitation that the girls had sent out, and made up his mind that he didn't at all approve of the intended exhibition. He thought that it was his duty to prevent it, and consequently decided that he would call upon Lola's father and state his objections. So one day he appeared at the house and sent in his card. Lola's father did not have the pleasure of his acquaintance, but supposing that he called upon some matter of business, of course directed that Mr. Gudgeon should be shown in. Mr. Gudgeons entered, and after a few stiff words of greeting, entered at once upon the object of his visit. "I have called, sir," said he, "for the purpose of making my protest against this performance of your daughter's." "To what performance do you refer?" Lola's father inquired, for he hadn't the faintest idea what Mr. Gudgeons meant. "I refer, sir," Mr. Gudgeons went on. to the exhibition that as i am credibly informed is to be given in a few days upon your estate the matter was not at all clear to lola's father who for the moment had forgotten all about his daughter's request so he said if you'll kindly explain more fully mr gudgeons i believe is your name yes gudgeons i shall be better able to understand the purpose of your call i will make myself perfectly plain sir answered his visitor I have learned from the daughter of an acquaintance that your daughter is about to exhibit a trick pony to her young friends. Ah, yes," said Lola's father. "I believe she did speak to me of something of the sort, but really I'd quite forgotten about it for the moment. I remember now. Yes, she certainly asked me to consent to her showing some of her pony's tricks, and I believe she sent invitations to some little girls. And you consented? Certainly. I can see no objection. Is there any objection? I can think of any number. Objection? Why, sir, in the first place, this is in the nature of a theatrical performance or a circus. 
Perhaps the latter would be a more fitting term. Now, I do not approve of children's witnessing such performances. I believe them to be in the highest degree demoralizing and unsettling to the mind of childhood. Well, well, Lola's father exclaimed. I must admit that I do not share your views. I can see no possible harm in this little party. Have you any other objection to make? Certainly I have. Are you aware that such actions as are called tricks in animals are entirely foreign to the animals' natures? That they are, in fact, a form of cruelty to animals? Why, sir, no animal in a state of nature ever performs tricks. Nothing except a long course of whipping and starvation will induce the poor creatures to go through the painful and the unnatural attitudes and gestures required in these so-called performances. I deem it, sir, my duty to protest against such... such exhibitions, wherever they are announced. You surprise me extremely, Lola's father said when Mr. Gudgeons had paused for breath. And though I see that you mean to do what you consider your duty, I really think that you may in this case give yourself no further trouble in the matter. The pony belonging to my daughter has always been treated with the utmost kindness, and it gives him pleasure to go through his tricks. This I know. So if you have no further remarks to make, I shall ask you to set your mind at rest. I see, said Mr. Gudgeons, that my efforts are entirely wasted. There are persons who... Here Lola's father rose from his chair and came over to his visitor, who stopped talking as he approached. Perhaps he saw by the other's expression that he had better not go too far. Lola's father said nothing, but he quietly picked up Mr. Gudgeon's hat and cane, handed them to him with a bow, and then stood holding the door open. "'I wish you good morning,' said Mr. Gudgeon's, who was very angry. "'But... I wish you to understand that my protest has been made. Good morning, said Lola's father, and his visitor departed. On the way to the front gate, Mr. Gudgeon suddenly came upon a little group. Lola and Pauline were standing close by Galopoff when Mr. Gudgeon's approached. Seeing them, he stopped and at once began to speak. Which of you, he said, is the owner of this pony? I am, sir, said Lola, politely, much surprised to be addressed by the stranger in so abrupt a way. Then you are the little girl that is to give this so-called exhibition in which this poor, dumb animal... At this, Galopoff gave an indignant snort, and both the girls burst out into a giggle, as even the best of little girls will sometimes do, especially when they are embarrassed. Mr. Gudgeons at once lost his temper. He thought the children were laughing at him. Turning sharply upon them, he said, I am not surprised to find you lacking in breeding and in good manners. In fact, my talk with your father ought to have prepared me for something quite as impertinent. Now, Galopoff was usually a very well-behaved little fellow, but he had his own ideas of what good manners required, and when Mr. Gudgeon said this about the girls and their father... Galopoff came dancing up, and in a moment he had kicked up his heels so close to that gentleman's head that Mr. Gudgeons was scared out of his wits. He started back suddenly, and his high hat fell off. Quick as a wink, Galopoff hit it squarely with his two little hoofs, and the hat went flying into the air, knocked out of shape. "'You little brute!' held Mr. Gudgeons. "'If I owned you, you'd get a thrashing for this that you wouldn't forget in a hurry, I promise you!' and he shook his fist at Galopoff in a very threatening manner. Then Galopoff pretended to fly into a great rage. He danced on his hind legs, he reared and plunged and snapped his teeth together, and at last he shook his head and started for Mr. Gudgeon so fiercely that the man fairly took to his heels and ran out of the gate and down the road as fast as he could go. When he was gone, Galopoff was so delighted that he rolled over upon his back and fairly whinnied with laughter. The girls, too, were laughing as hard as they could, so that for some time they could not speak. At length, Lola said, Oh, Galopoff, do you think you ought to have done that? No, the pony replied, getting up and shaking himself to get rid of the dust. I know I shouldn't have done it, but that's just why I enjoyed it so much. It's a long time since I've had so much fun. Did you see me scare him out of his wits? 
But you spoiled his hat, said Pauline. I know it, said Galopoff, but everybody wants to kick a high hat. It does make such a delightful bang. It is the first chance I've had for two years, and I really couldn't help it. Did you hear his impudence? Yes, it was shameful, Lola said, and I'm glad he's gone. But now let us go on to arrange about the circus. Don't you want to go over some of your acts? Just as you like, Galopoff replied. Suppose we try that little act with the tilting board. The girls agreed, and all three went over to a corner of the garden where there was a sort of seesaw. It was a thick plank fastened upon the edge of a triangular block so as to balance. Galopoff stood near one end of it, while the two girls climbed upon the other as it rested on the ground. When they were safely perched there, the pony put his forefeet on the other end of the board. His weight raised the board into the air, and the two girls were several feet from the ground. They had expected him to climb up on the board, a number of cross pieces being nailed on it in order to keep him from slipping. But instead of doing this, Galopoff remained standing on his end of the board, and kept the two girls high in air until they were afraid they would slide off. Galopoff, called Pauline. Why don't you climb up? We're slipping off. Do hurry! But I am thinking, Galopoff said, very coolly. Hurry! said Pauline again, clutching the board tightly. I am thinking about a motto I saw once, said Galopoff slyly. I was wondering whether it is always true that it is better to have the feet slip than the tongue. Did you ever hear that? Then the girls remembered the motto they had hung in Galopoff's stall that day, and knew that the pony was having a little joke at their expense. Oh, Galopoff, said Lola, you ought to let that go. What, the board? Galopoff asked. No, no, the motto. You know we're sorry. Oh, very well, said the pony. Then we'll say no more about it. And I'll just climb up on the board and let you down nearer to the ground. So saying, he scrambled to his place on the end of the plank, and then they teetered for a long time up and down, slowly and fast, in a very graceful manner. The rest of the afternoon was spent in practising other feats, so as to prepare for the exhibition, which was to take place at the end of that same week. End of chapter 12of Galopoff the Talking Pony. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Subhash Chandra. www.subhashsings.com Galopoff the Talking Pony by Tudor Jenks The Circus at Lola's Home be the day weary or be the day long, at length it ringeth the even song. And the great day of the circus came, though it had seemed to a number of the little girls who were invited that old father time must have taken a snooze somewhere along the way. The great day dawned bright and clear, with just the little snap of cold in the air which gives a tang to each breath. Patrick had been busy all the previous day building a row of seats for the little spectators, although he grumbled good-naturedly over the foolishness of the childers. Patrick secretly had a strong desire to witness the show, but Lola's father had given him an important errand that took him to town for the whole afternoon. When it was the hour for the show to begin, the row of seats were hidden by rows of little chattering girls who made a most effective trimming in their brightly coloured costumes and their hats smiling with gaudy ribbons. But Lola, Pauline and the pony were nowhere to be seen. The audience fluttered their fans and programmes, talked all together in the most delightful deafness to whatever was said in reply and giggled at nothing and at everything simply because they were happy. Suddenly a bell rang and all the little heads turned at once in the direction of the sound. Surely, surely something was coming. Yes, there was no mistake. The famous trick pony came trotting briskly from the stable, harnessed to a carriage in which were seated Miss Lola and Miss Pollen, as proud as if both had just been elected to a second term in the presidential chair. But that was not all. 
the carriage was in holiday attire being brilliantly decked out in flowers until it looked like the chariot of the goddess of flowers herself little girls do not cheer nor do they give college yells but they do know how to make noises to show they are delighted and little girls who were the spectators of this grand entry squealed and exclaimed oh my and do look violet and pinched each other as they squealed which caused them to squeal some more altogether it was a bright brilliant noisy and cheerful occasion galop of came swinging up before them with all the style of an operatic singer and then stopping short he bowed his head most gracefully first to one and then to another group then he suddenly stood stock still and rigid like a soldier upon parade he was waiting to be properly presented this was lola's duty at first she had wished to have her father come and say a few words of introduction but though he usually was very obliging he had said no to this at once it is best not to have any grown person there at all he told lola make it just a little girls party and then your friends will enjoy it a hundred times better i shall be home that afternoon writing and if you should want me for anything you need only call me but you won't need me i am sure except when you have the little supper of course you wouldn't leave your poor old father out then lola laughed and promised to let her father know when there was something brought out to eat and then went to her own room to prepare her little speech this was her speech as she now spoke it she stepped from the little carriage and making a sort of dancing school curtsy first to the right and then to the left she began my friends paulin and i have had great fun with our little russian pony galopov he is the best little horse that ever was and he knows a great deal galopov has had many adventures in his life and among other things he has made his own living at a time when he had no master to care for him he became a trick pony in a circus and gave exhibitions both in europe and in this country and now although he has no need to show off his tricks for money he is glad to please his friends by giving a little entertainment of course he could do more in a regular circus ring than he can do here for there they have all the things the stands the hoops the banners and such things besides a grand ringmaster to show him and a clown to make jokes still we shall do the best we can to please you and we hope that you all will enjoy the exhibition lola now that her speech was over suddenly became quite frightened at the idea that she had really made so long an address and brought it to an end by saying quickly the first thing that galopov will do will be to dance a waltz and then she took a seat in a chair beside paulin then a band that was hidden behind some shrubbery at a little distance began to play far from the ball and galopov making another bow glided gracefully into a waltz step making a very pretty picture as he moved over the green lawn with bowing head and long mane and tail waving next came leaping and galopov beginning with things as low as a barrel and a wheelbarrow gradually jumped higher and higher until as a final feat he leaped over the pony carriage amid loud applause after the leaping galopov gave exhibitions of various gaits he walked trotted cantered paced galloped and ran by lola announced each different style then a long timber was brought out by two of the men about the farm and when it was set up on edge galopov walked along its whole length turned without falling off and walked back again just as he had done for lola and paulin that day at the pasture walking upon the hind legs was the next event and then a few of the little guests were allowed to ride on galopov while he gently cantered over the lawn a barrel was now brought out and galopov mounting upon it as a circus performer does upon a ball balanced himself upon it and rolled it three times to and fro in front of the spectators the next act was a game of ball in which paulin taking a rubber ball tossed it to the pony 
he would catch it in his mouth and toss it back to her this game delighted the children especially because pauline would often fail to catch the ball while galopoff never did after this galopoff lay down upon his back and put his four feet into the air then an umbrella was turned upside down and galopoff kept it spinning on top of his hoofs while this act was not so very hard it was a pretty one and made the children laugh and clap their hands it would take too long to describe all the acts galopoff performed but one or two of them were quite dramatic the first of these was called hide and seek for this galopoff was blindfolded and then pauline would go and hide somewhere within sight of the spectators and would keep perfectly still galopoff would then go sniffing about over the grass and would find the hidden one it was not a very difficult trick but it proved very amusing another act consisted in having a tumbler full of water set upon the pony's back whereupon he would travel at quite a brisk pace without upsetting it the final scene was the one of which galopoff had spoken to lola and pauline the cossack pony rescues his wounded master in this act both lola and pauline had to help one of them was supposed to represent the pony's master while the other played the part of the enemy the spectators first saw lola come riding in upon galopoff with one arm tied up in a sling as if she had been wounded and then she was supposed to make a camp she built a little fire of sticks and pretended to cook a dinner over it as she was doing so galopoff turned loose to find his own meal was supposed to wander away so he went off quite a distance cropping the grass now and then as he walked meanwhile lola having cooked her soldier dinner wrapped herself in a sort of blanket and pretended to fall into a deep sleep pauline representing an enemy's scout now came creeping up to the sleeping soldier and attacked him with a lance represented by a long lath with a sharp blade whittled upon one end of it lola awoke and tried to defend herself with a wooden dagger which also had been made from a bit of wood the two little girls really acted their parts very well and the struggle of the one armed soldier to defend himself from the lancer was exciting of course there could be but one end to such a combat however and soon lola was forced to retreat and at last the dagger was knocked from her hand and she fell back upon the ground apparently at the mercy of a cruel foe then suddenly was heard a neigh from the distant pony and galopoff came rushing at full speed to his wounded master's aid pauline turned as the pony came up and seemed to make an attempt to defend herself with the lance but galopoff in an instant caught the lance in his teeth wrested it from pauline's hand put one of his forelegs over it and broke it then he pretended to charge at pauline with fury dancing upon his hind legs and pawing at her with his four hoofs pauline was really the least bit afraid of him but that only made her acting seem more natural as she took to her heels and ran away as fast as she could go galopoff thereupon shook his white mane in triumph neighed in defiance and then trotted slowly over to lola and gently nudged her with his nose she half rose and then grasping his mane pulled herself upright galopoff then crouched down she climbed upon his back and he galloped away with her to safety it was really a very thrilling little performance and the girls all enjoyed it amazingly indeed they applauded so long that the three little performers had to return and bow their thanks for the generous applause they made a pretty little group with galopoff standing in the middle and the two girls one at each side this was the end of the performance and the spectators climbed down from the seats and gathered about the little horse petting him stroking him and calling him pet names galopoff enjoyed this and his bright eyes glistened with pleasure to see how delighted they all were with the performance then came the servants from the house tables were set up on the lawn lola's father came out to greet the little guests and supper was served altogether there was nothing to interfere with the enjoyment of the day and even galopoff had all the lumps of sugar he wanted but lola pauline and the little pony were very tired when their guests went home and that night all slept so soundly that they never dreamed a single dream end of the circus at lola's home recording by subhash chandra www.subhashsings.com
Chapter 14 of Gallopoff the Talking Pony. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by JPAL90. Gallopoff the Talking Pony by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 14 What They Found by the Seaside. As the summer went on and the sun became warmer, then hotter, and finally really torrid and horrid, Lola's father made up his mind that it would be an excellent thing to pack up and go to the seaside for a week or two. Patrick was sent up into the attic and one by one the family trunks came bumping downstairs. Then came the fun of packing them, and of deciding what must go, what might go in, and what ought to be left at home. Pauline had been invited to go too and so one day Gallopoff drew the baggage wagon down to the station and brought back her trunk, which had been partly packed in the city and was to be filled at Lola's. This proved to be lucky, for there was some room left in the top of it, and this was delightfully convenient to hold the many things that had been crowded out of the other trunks. When the baggage was all ready, Lola went out to see Gallopoff and found Patrick at work in the stable polishing up a set of harness. As soon as he saw Lola coming, Patrick called out, It'll be missing the pony you'll be when you sit by the great wet sea, so you will. But never you fear, miss, you leave him in the best of hands. I tend him as if he was a baby. Whenever there's a breath of air stirring, wish the blanket goes on him, and it's a good rubbing down he gets every day. Thank you, Pat, Lola answered. I know you'd take good care of Gallopoff if I should leave him to you, but he is going too. Is the pony going? Pat said in pretended surprise. It must cost a pretty penny to be carrying the likes of him around the country, a joint of a horse like that. I should think the railroads would be after putting props under all the bridges for fear of their coming down, so I would. Now, Pat, said Lola, I believe you're joking. I believe you knew he was going all the time, truly, didn't you? I heard tell of it, he replied, but I couldn't see the sense of it at all at all. Sure, if I were going to the seashore, it's a boat I'd be wanting rather than a horse. Maybe you'll teach him to swim. When Pat was poking fun, he always talked with a heavy brogue, for when he liked, he could use very good English. Lola never minded his joking, but just now she had come to talk with the pony, and was not greatly amused by Pat's fooling. So she sat down and, without saying a word, quietly watched Pat's polishing of the harness. But Pat was in a talkative mood and did not seem to mind whether Lola talked or not. He rubbed away briskly at the buckles with an old piece of leather, and his tongue moved as briskly as his hand. "'Did you know, Miss Lola,' said he, "'that the sailors believe monkeys can talk? Maybe ye, ye never heard that. And maybe again ye did, for they do teach a power of things in schools nowadays besides Italian, reading, writing, arithmetic, and dumbbells. The sailors say that the reason monkeys don't talk is for fear they'll be put to work.' And you mind, I believe that pony of yours, Gallopoff, knows more than a heap of things that he doesn't tell. Here, Gallopoff gave a snort of indignation. At least it sounded so to Lola. And Patrick went on. Do you hear that now? Wouldn't you think the cute little horse knew what I was saying? Course tis unpossible. But wouldn't you think so? Yes, said Lola. I certainly should. And if it is possible that Gallopoff knows what we're saying... Don't you think it would be more polite not to talk about him? True for you, Pat replied. But never fear, handsome as he looks, and I'm not for denying he's an expressive eye. He must have only a horse's brains, and that's not so different from a donkey's, Miss Lola. Then they heard a tremendous racket in Gallopoff's stall. He jumped about and kicked an old pail half across the stable. War there! Pat shouted, rising and going to see what was the matter. He soon came back, saying, Maybe it was a fly bit him or the like of that. But he's quiet enough now, and so I'll leave you with him while I go to the tool shop to mend a strap. You're not afraid? Oh my no, said Lola. And to prove it, she went directly into the stall by Gallopoff's side, whereupon he put down his nose to be stroked. Patrick went out, and as soon as he was out of hearing, Gallopoff heaved a long breath of relief. Phew, he said. There, now you can see what I have to put up with. Sometimes that Irishman makes me wild to give him a good blowing up. 
What do you suppose he would do if I should begin to give him a talking to some day? I don't know, I'm sure, Lola answered, laughing. But I know I should like to see it. Why don't you try it? I can't tell, really, Galopoff answered, very seriously. After all, Pat is right. I am nothing but a horse, and I have my instincts as well as some reason. What do you mean? Lola asked, for she didn't understand very well, and she knew from Galopoff's manner that he was in earnest. I mean, Galopoff answered, that I know I mustn't do some things, though I can give you no reason. I know that I mustn't talk to anybody but children. Why, I can't tell you. That is my instinct, that's all. Then Galopoff and Lola had a long talk about their visit to the seaside, but although they both thought of a great many things that might happen, neither of them ever imagined anything about the most exciting, most interesting, and most delightful thing that did happen. The journey to the sea was not eventful. Galopoff had a comfortable stall in a baggage car, and the family were in a car not far away, so that Lola and Pauline made several visits to the pony on the trip. They enjoyed the views along the way, and the gradual change from the heavy and warm air of the inland region to the bracing salt air of the coast was most grateful. Arrived by the sea, they found comfortable quarters, the family being in the hotel and Galopoff in a fine stable nearby. Then began days of pure, delicious air, balmy sunshine and long, idle hours upon the beach. Every morning, early, Lola and Pauline would come scampering out in their bathing suits, and Galopoff would join them for a dip into the surf, and for a magnificent frolic with wind and waves. Galopoff, being a strong and hearty little fellow, proved a steady and skilful swimmer, often going out so far that the little girls were quite worried about him. Indeed, once they saw the sharp fin of a shark come gliding through the water close to where the pony was swimming, and they called to him. But the pony saw the danger quite as soon as they, and at once began such a kicking and a plunging that the shark shot off into deeper water as if scared out of his wits. When the pony came back to the beach, Galopoff told them that they needn't worry about him, that he was no more afraid of sharks than of wolves. There was little chance to talk to the pony, for almost always there were people about, but the few talks Lola and Pauline had with him showed that all were enjoying their vacation every minute. One night, Toward the end of their stay, Lola and Pauline were waked from their sleep by the roaring and howling of the wind and the booming of a heavy surf upon the beach. At least they thought these sounds awoke them, but probably it was the noise and bustle of the people in the hotel. Everyone seemed to be running about and talking. The two girls did not know what had happened, but decided to rise, dress, and go downstairs to find out. When they came down into the hall of the hotel, they found Lola's father there, talking to some other men. What has happened, father? Lola asked as soon as she could. I'm sorry you're here, he answered. But now you're awake, you might as well know. A steamer has been driven on a shoal not far away, and the sea is beating so heavily against her that the men fear she will break up. Where are the lifesavers? asked Pauline, for both girls knew there was a station not far away along the beach. They are at work, Lola's father said but so far have not been able to do much. Wrap yourselves up as well as you can, and we will go down near the shore and see what they are doing. It may do you good all your lives to see those heroes at work. So Lola and Pauline were buttoned into their heaviest jackets and muffled in hoods and bloomers, and clinging to a helping hand now and then, made their way against the blinding storm to the beach. Far out they could see dimly the great hulk of the stranded steamer, where a light or two shone and on the beach near them, the lifesavers were trying to send a line to the wreck. If a line could be sent to the sailors on the steamer, it would serve to bring them a rope, and by means of the rope, their lives might be saved before the steamer went to pieces. Once, twice, three times the gun was fired, but each time the shot that carried the line went astray. Once the aim was not good, the second time it fell short, and the third time the line broke. They had no other shot, and so were forced to try some other plan. When it was seen that the gun was abandoned, a groan went up from the people on the beach. Though they had before tried in vain to launch a boat, they now tried once more. Men plunged waist-deep into the Black Sea, 
waited for a wave to roll past, leaped into the boat, and tugged with all their might at the oars in order to force the boat beyond the next breaker. Three times they tried, three times they failed. And the last time the great boat was whirled upward end over end and flung upon the sand so fiercely that her side was staved in. May the Lord help them now, but we can do no more, exclaimed one of the lifesavers as he was dragged ashore. There is no other big boat and no man could live in such breakers. Oh, father, cried Lola with clenched hands. Is there nothing they can do? I know of nothing, he said. And then there came into Lola's mind a story she had read some time before. A story of shipwreck where a rope was carried out to the sinking ship by a man on horseback. She caught her breath and for a moment put the idea out of her mind. And then, setting her teeth together, she rose, and telling her father she would return soon, she fought her way back to the hotel. Then she went to the stable, unlocked the door, and made her way to Galopoff's stall. Galopoff, she said, I don't know whether I'm doing right or not, but there's a steamer stranded on the beach. The men are trying to save the people and they can't get a rope to them. I read once that a horse swam out when neither boat nor man could go. I thought I'd tell you, you are so wise and so brave. Do you think you could do it and get back safe? Do you, Kalapov, dear? Lola was crying when she ended. In the light of the stable lantern, she saw the little pony's eye flash and his nostrils dilate as he proudly tossed his head. Do I? Lola, I don't know whether I can do it or not, but I do know that I ought to try. Living isn't all play. Unfasten the bar and let us hurry! Lola took down the bar, scrambled to Galopoff's back, clinging to his thick mane, and away they galloped through the darkness to the beach, faster than Lola had ever ridden. Cling tight, Lola! the pony cried, as he went faster and faster. It seemed but a minute or two before they were amid the throng on the beach. Lola! shouted her father. Have you lost your senses? No, father, she answered, with her mouth close to his ear so that no one else should hear. But I remembered how a horse once carried a line to a wreck and... But it's your own dear pony, her father began. Then he stopped for a moment and went on again. I believe you're right, Lola. Right or wrong, it ought to be tried. If the little fellow will go. Go? Of course he'll go, said Lola proudly. Look at him. There stood Galopoff like a warhorse, head up, tail and mane waving in the gale. Lola's father shouted to the captain of the life-saving crew, Here, captain, give me the line. The horse will take it out to the ship. The captain turned and looked at him and at Galopoff. Evidently, he thought the plan a wild one. But there was nothing else to do, so he picked up the line and handed it to Lola's father. A noose was made in it and fastened around Galopoff's body, and dashing forward, the brave pony plunged into the sea. Soon he was swallowed in darkness, but the line kept moving. Slowly it went outward, and still outward. Now and then it would slacken for a few moments, and then Lola's heart stood still as she wondered whether she would ever see the loved little pony again. But again the line moved forward, ever forward. Once more it stopped, and then came a terrible pause. Lola actually held her breath and tightly clasped Pauline's hand. Was Galopoff overcome by the waves? No! See, up from the steamer shoots a long stream of light! A rocket bursts high in air and its gleaming stars are blown away by the gale. Heaven be praised, cries the captain. The pony has carried the line to the ship. Come in, rig the breeches boy and send out the ropes. Another rocket was fired on the beach and then a big rope fastened to the first line was drawn out to the ship. This rope once in place, the rest of the work went on rapidly and soon the breeches boy travelled out to the steamer. Back it came, carrying a young man a fine-looking young fellow, and in his hands he held firmly a rope, and at the end of this rope came Galopoff, swimming almost as strongly as when he first set out. 
Then how the people cheered, and Lola and Pauline fairly fell upon the pony's neck as he came out of the boiling surf. No sooner had Galopoff shaken the brine from his eyes and mouth, than he gasped out, Oh, Lola! Oh, Pauline! This is my little master! The little Russian prince! And I have saved him! End of chapter 14、Chapter 15 By Tudor Jenks, Chapter Fifteen. Happy Ever After. That was a joyous meeting, and all the more joyous because the wind had now begun to die down, and the passengers and the crew of the steamer were coming ashore as fast as a buoy could travel. All were saved and were cared for at the hotel. The next morning, after he had rested, the little Russian prince told his adventures. Since his escape by Galopoff's help from Siberia, he had traveled many a weary mile. He worked all sorts of trades to earn his way after his money was gone. But at last he secured passage on a steamer for America. He told his story resting against Galopoff's side and with one arm around the pony's neck. Lola and Pauline sat opposite to him. Listening with smiles and tears to the little prince's adventures, it was enough now that he was safe again, and that the pony and his master were once more united. As for the future, all would be settled at another time. During the rest of their stay at the beach, the little prince, as the girls would call him, though really he was about eighteen and a well grown, sturdy, handsome young fellow. Was their big brother, and entered into all their games as heartily as the happy Galopoff himself. Before they all returned to Lola's home, the men who had been saved from the wreck bought a fine silver collar for Galopoff and had it engraved with his name and a record of his heroism in saving so many lives. Galopoff pretended to think they were needlessly fussy about it. But the girls soon found that the pony had no objection to wear his medal on Sundays and holidays. The Russian prince went back with them, and Lola's father provided work for him, so that he was able to make his home near the girls and to see them and Galopoff several times each week. Lola and Pauline were, of course, a little afraid of him at first, but soon this feeling disappeared. And they discovered that a strong, brave, good natured young man was an excellent friend to have in time of need. The prince and Galopoff were the jolliest of companions, and now there was no need to have Patrick go upon their picnics and other little excursions, which was a great relief to Galopoff, no doubt. Lola was never jealous of the pony's affection for his former master. And never felt left out, except when the prince talked Russian to Galopoff, which was not often. The months rolled by, formed themselves into years, and still the friendship of the quartet was unbroken. Galopoff, though a little stiff in the joints, and not quite so ready to perform tricks, remained strong and sturdy, and able to do his part in whatever was going on. At Christmas, it was Galopoff who came plunging through the snow, dragging the Christmas tree from the woods, as sturdily as he had fought his way through the waves of the wrecked sailors. The young prince became an excellent young American citizen, and prospered in his new home, until he was able to fit out a house of his own. And you may be sure that there was the finest stable you ever saw. Not far from the house, under a beautiful spreading elm tree, in the stable, as Lola saw to her dismay, 
There was a stall made of polished mahogany and fitted up with shining metal, fit for a king but small enough for a pony. Lola, when being shown over the place, stood in silence, gazing upon this little parlor of a stall. Then she turned to the young master of the house, saying, And what is this for? Is it for Galopoff when he comes to visit you? No, answered the prince. At least I hope not. I hope that you would give Galopoff back to me when I had a place for him. Lola turned and looked at him. Oh, she exclaimed, do you think I can give up my dear pony even to you? Not at all, he said, taking her hand. I will never take Galopoff from you. I would not come between you for anything in the world, but I want you both. Come, dear Lola, marry me, and we three will never separate as long as we live. While Lola stood looking into the young prince's bright eyes, there came the patter of the four little hoofs and into the door came Galopoff. He walked slowly up to them, as they stood there hand in hand, and then he gave a jolly little skip and said in a deep voice, Bless you, my children. The End End of Chapter 15 Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee End of Galopoff the Talking Pony by Tudor Jenks in Season 2 of Missing Pages, we'll take a look at what happens when an old system faces new challenges. This is what happens when you involve money. I'm Beth Ann Patrick, your host of Season 2 of the Missing Pages podcast. We'll dig into these stories and talk to authors like Jody Picot for their firsthand experiences. You can childproof your world, but you can't worldproof your child. Listen and subscribe to Season 2 of Missing Pages wherever you get your podcasts.